Amaranta Ursula and little Orleano had to remember the flood as a happy time. Despite Fernanda's rigor, they splashed around in the swamps of the patio, hunted lizards to dismember them, and played at poisoning the soup by throwing powder from the wings of butterflies in the carelessness of Santa Sofia de la Piedad. Ursula was his most entertaining toy. They had her for a large decrepit doll that they carried and brought around the corners, disguised with colored rags and her face painted with soot and anato, and once they were on the point of gutting her eyes as they did to toads with pruning shears. Nothing caused them more exhilaration than their ravings. Indeed, something must have happened in his brain in the third year of the rain, because little by little he lost his sense of reality, and he confused the current time with remote times of his life, to the point that on one occasion he passed three days crying without consolation for the death of Petronilla Iguaran, her great-grandmother, who had been buried for more than a century. He sank into such a crazy state of confusion that he believed that little Orleano was his son the colonel at the time when he was brought to know the ice, and that José Arcadio who was then in the seminary was the firstborn who left. With the gypsies. He talked so much about the family that the children learned to organize imaginary visits with beings that had not only died for a long time, but had existed at different times. Sitting on the bed with her hair covered in ash and her face covered with a red scarf, Ursula was happy in the midst of the unreal family that the children described without omission of details, as if they had really known her. Ursula talked with her ancestors about events prior to her own existence, enjoyed the news they gave her and cried with them for deaths much more recent than the fellow members of the group. The children did not take long to notice that in the course of those ghostly visits Ursula always posed a question designed to establish who it was that had brought a life-size plaster St. Joseph to the house during the war to keep while the rain passed. This is how Orleano Segundo remembered the fortune buried somewhere that only Ursula knew, but the questions and cunning maneuvers that occurred to her were useless, because in the labyrinths of her delirium she seemed to retain a margin of lucidity to defend that secret which he only had to reveal to whoever proved to be the true owner of the buried gold. She was so clever and so strict that when Orleano Segundo instructed one of his party companions to pose as the owner of the fortune, she entangled him in a meticulous interrogation and strewn with subtle traps. Convinced that Ursula would take the secret to the grave, Orleano Segundo hired a team of excavators under the pretext that they would build drainage channels in the patio and in the backyard and he himself probed the ground with iron bars and with all kinds of of metal detectors, finding nothing that looked like gold in three months of exhaustive scans. Later he turned to Pilar Turnera in the hope that the decks would see more than the diggers, but she began by explaining that any attempt was useless as long as Ursula was not the one who cut the card. On the other hand, I confirmed the existence of the treasure, with the precision that there were 7,214 coins buried in three canvas sacks with copper wire straps, within a circle with a radius of 122 meters, taking as the center the bed of Ursula, but warned that he would not be found before it had just rained and the suns of three consecutive June turned the mud flats to dust. The profusion and meticulous vagueness of the data seemed to Orleano Segundo so similar to spiritist fables that he insisted on his undertaking despite the fact that it was in August and it would have been necessary to wait at least three years to satisfy the conditions of the forecast. The first thing that astonished him, although at the same time his confusion increased, was the fact that it was exactly 122 meters from Ursula's bed to the fence of the backyard. Fernanda feared that he was as crazy as his twin brother when she saw him doing the measurements, and even worse when he ordered the digging crews to go one meter deeper into the trenches. Prey to an exploratory delirium comparable only to that of his great-grandfather when he sought the root of inventions, Orleano Segundo lost the last remaining bags of fat, and the old. The resemblance to the twin brother was accentuated again, not only by the flow of the figure, but by the distant air and the self-absorbed attitude. He did not take care of the children again. He ate at any hour, muddy from head to toe, and he did so in a corner of the kitchen, barely answering the occasional questions from Santa Bofia de la Piedad. Seeing him work in that way, as she never dreamed he could do it, Fernanda believed that his recklessness was diligence, and that if greed was self-denial and that his stubbornness was perseverance, and her gut was condemned by the virulence with which she had railed against her indolence. But Orleano Segundo was not at that time for merciful reconciliations. 
Thrown up to his neck in a swamp of dead twigs and rotting flowers, he turned the garden floor up and down after finishing the patio and backyard, and so deeply drilled the foundations of the house's eastern gallery that one night they woke up terrified by what seemed to be a cataclysm, both from the tremors and the terrifying underground creaking, and it was that three rooms were falling apart and a chill crevice had opened from the corridor to Fernanda's bedroom. Orleano Segundo did not give up the exploration for this reason. Even though the last hopes were extinguished and the only thing that seemed to make any sense were the predictions of the decks, he reinforced the jagged foundation, patched the crack with mortar, and continued digging on the western side. It was still there the second week of the following June, when the rain began to subside and the clouds were rising, and it was seen that at any moment it was going to clear. That's how it went. One Friday at two in the afternoon the world was lit up with a silly sun, red and rough as brick dust, and almost as cool as water, and it hadn't rained again for ten years. Macondo was in ruins. In the swamps of the streets were torn pieces of furniture, skeletons of animals covered in red lilies, last memories of the hordes of upstarts who fled from Macondo as recklessly as they had arrived. The houses that had been so urgently stopped during the banana rush had been abandoned. The banana company dismantled its facilities. Only the rubble remained of the old barbed wire city. The wooden houses, the cool terraces where the serene card afternoons were spent, seemed swept away by an anticipation of the prophetic wind that years later would wipe Macondo off the face of the earth. The only human trace left by that voracious murmur was a glove from Patricia Brown in the car suffocated by the Trinita Dians. The enchanted region that José Arcadio Buendía explored at the time of the founding, and where the banana plantations later prospered, was a quagmire of rotten vines, in whose remote horizon the silent foam of the sea could be seen for several years. Orleano Segundo suffered a crisis of affliction the first Sunday when he dressed in dry clothes and went out to reconnoiter the town. I survived the winds of the catastrophe, the same people who already lived in Macondo before it was hit by the hurricane of the Banana Company, were sitting in the middle of the street enjoying the first suns. They still had the green seaweed on their skin and the corner smell that the rain gave them, but deep down in their hearts they seemed satisfied to have recovered the town in which they were born. The street of the Turks was once again the one of before, the one of the times when the Arabs with slippers and earrings who travelled the world exchanging macaws for trinkets, found in Macondo a good corner to rest from their millinery status as people migratory. Across the rain, the bazaar wares were falling apart, the open goods at the door were streaked with moss, the counters undermined by termites, and the walls eaten away by moisture, but the third-generation Arabs were sitting in the same place and in the same attitude as their parents and grandparents, taciturn, undaunted, invulnerable to time and disaster, as alive or as dead as they were after the insomnia plague and the colonel's 32 wars Orleano Buendia. Their strength of mind was so amazing in the face of the rubble of the gaming tables, the fried food stalls, the target shooting booths and the alley where dreams were interpreted and the future was guessed, that Orleano Segundo asked them with his informality habitual of what mysterious resources they had used to avoid shipwreck in the storm, how the hell had they done not to drown, and one after another, from door to door, they returned a sly smile and a dreamy look, and they all gave him. Without putting according to the same answer. Swimming. Petra Coates was perhaps the only native who had the heart of an Arab. He had seen the last damage to his stables and stables washed away by the storm, but he had managed to keep the house standing. In the last year, he had sent urgent messages to Orleano Segundo, and he had replied that he did not know when he would return home but that in any case he would bring a drawer of gold coins to stone the bedroom. Then she had dug into his heart, seeking the strength that would allow her to survive misfortune, and had found a reflective and just rage, with which she had sworn to restore the fortune squandered by her lover and just exterminated by the flood. It was such an unbreakable decision that Orleano Segundo returned home eight months after the last errand, and found it green, disheveled, with sunken eyelids and skin frosted by scabies but he was writing numbers on little pieces of paper, to make a raffle. Orleano Segundo was astonished, and he was so emaciated and so solemn that Petra Coates did not believe that the one who had returned to look for her was her lifelong lover, but her twin brother. You're crazy, he said. 
unless you plan to raffle the bones. Then she told him to look into the bedroom, and Orleano Segundo saw the mule. Her skin was glued to her bones, like the owner, but as alive and determined as she. Petra Coates had fed her with her rage, and when she had no more herbs, no corn, no roots, she sheltered her in her own bedroom and fed her the calico sheets, the Persian rugs, the plush bedspreads, the cotton curtains. Velvet and the canopy embroidered with gold threads and silk tassels of the episcopal bed. Ursula had to make a great effort to fulfill her promise to die when it clears. The flashes of lucidity that were so rare during the rain became more frequent count from August, when the arid wind began to blow, suffocating the rose bushes and petrifying the swamps, and that I ended up scattering the scorching dust over Macondo that forever covered the rusty zinc roofs and the centuries-old almond trees. Ursula cried with pity when I discovered that for more than three years she had been left as a children's toy. He washed his painted face, got rid of the colorful strips, the dried lizards and toads, and the jimbles and ancient Arab necklaces that had hung all over his body, and for the first time since Amaranta's death he got out of bed without the help of anyone to rejoin family life. The spirit of her invincible heart guided her in the darkness. Those who noticed her stumbling and stumbled over her archangelic arm always raised at the height of the head, thought that she could hardly handle her body, but they still did not believe that she was blind. She did not need to see to realize that the flower beds, cultivated with such care since the first reconstruction, had been destroyed by the rain and washed away by the excavations of Orleano Segundo, and that the walls and cement of the floors were cracked. The loose and faded furniture, the unhinged doors, and the family threatened by a spirit of resignation and regret that would not have been conceivable in their time. Groping through the empty bedrooms he perceived the continuous thunder of the termite drilling into the woods, and the scissoring of the moth in the closets, and the devastating din of the huge fire ants that had thrived in the flood and were undermining the foundations of the house. One day he opened the trunk of the saints, and had to ask Santa Sofia de la Piedad for help to get rid of the cockroaches that jumped from the interior, and that had already pulverized the clothes. It is not possible to live in this neglect, he said. At this rate we will end up being eaten by beasts. Since then he has not had a moment of rest. Up before dawn, she would go to whoever was available, including the children. He put the scant clothes that were still fit to be used in the sun, drove off the cockroaches with surprising rounds of insecticide, scraped the termite veins on doors and windows, and smothered the ants in their burrows with quicklime. The restoration fever ended up taking her to the forgotten rooms. He got rid of debris and Euleron as the room where José Arcadio Buendía dried his head looking for the philosopher's stone, put in order the silver workshop that had been disturbed by the soldiers, and finally asked for the keys to Melquiada's room to see what state it was in. Faithful to the will of José Arcadio Segundo, who had prohibited any interference as long as there was no real indication that he had died, Santa Sofia de la Piedad resorted to all kinds of subterfuges to disorient Ursula. But his determination was so inflexible not to abandon the insects or even the most hidden and useless corner of the house, that he destroyed every obstacle they crossed, and after three days of insistence he got the room opened for him. She had to hold on to the door so as not to be knocked down by the pestilence, but it didn't take her more than two seconds to remember that the seventy-two potties of the schoolgirls were stored there, and that on one of the first rainy nights a patrol of soldiers had searched the house looking for José Arcadio Segundo and had not been able to find him. Blessed be God! She exclaimed, as if she had seen everything. So much trying to instill in you good habits, so that you end up living like a pig. José Arcadio Segundo kept rereading the scrolls. The only thing visible in the intricate tangle of hairs were the green llama-striped teeth and the immobile eyes. Recognizing her great-grandmother's voice, she moved her head toward the door, tried to smile, and unknowingly repeated an old Ursula phrase. What did I want, I murmur, time passes. Yes, said Ursula, but not that much. As she said it, she was aware that she was giving the same reply that she received from Colonel Orleano Buendia in his sentenced cell, and once again she shuddered with the realization that time was not passing, as she had just admitted, but was spinning around in the round. 
but then he didn't give resignation a chance either. He scolded José Arcadio Segundo as if he were a child, and insisted that he bathe and shave and lend him his strength to finish restoring the house. The simple idea of leaving the room that had given him peace terrified José Arcadio Segundo. He shouted that there was no human power capable of making him leave, because he did not want to see the train of two hundred wagons loaded with the dead that left Macondo every evening for the sea. It's everyone who was at the station, he shouted. 3408. Only then did Ursula understand that he was in a world of darkness more impenetrable than his own, as insurmountable and lonely as that of his great-grandfather. He left it in the room, but he managed to prevent them from putting the lock back on, to do the cleaning every day, to throw the potties in the trash and leave only one, and to keep José Arcadio Segundo as clean and presentable as he was. Great-grandfather in his long captivity under the chestnut tree. At first, Fernanda interpreted that bustle as a fit of senile madness, and she could barely suppress her exasperation. But José Arcadio announced to him around that time from Rome that he planned to go to Macondo before making his perpetual vows, and the good news infused him with such enthusiasm that overnight he found himself watering the flowers four times a day so that his son was not going to form a bad impression of the house. It was that same incentive that led her to hasten her correspondence with the invisible doctors, and to replace the pots of ferns and oregano, and the pots of begonias, in the corridor, long before Ursula found out that they had been destroyed by fury. Exterminator of Orleano Segundo Later he sold the silver service, and bought ceramic tableware, pewter terrines, and ladles and nickel silver cutlery and with them he impoverished the cabinets used to the china of the Company of the Indies and the glassware of Bohemia. Ursula always tried to go further. Let them open doors and windows. She screamed. That they make meat and fish, that they buy the biggest turtles, that strangers come to spread their mats in the corners and urinate on the rose bushes, that they sit at the table to eat as many times as they want, and that they burp and rant and mud it all with their boots and let them do whatever they want with us, because that's the only way to scare away ruin. But it was a vain illusion. She was too old and living to repeat the miracle of the candy animals, and none of her descendants had inherited her strength. The house continued to be closed by order of Fernanda. Orleano Segundo, who had returned to take his trunks to Petra Coates's house, barely had the means to prevent the family from starving to death. With the mule raffle, he and Petra Coates had bought other animals, with which they managed to straighten out a rudimentary lottery business. Orleano Segundo walked from house to house, offering the tickets that he himself painted with colored inks to make them more attractive and convincing, and perhaps he did not realize that many bought them out of gratitude, and most out of compassion. But nevertheless still still most pious buyers acquired the opportunity to win a pig for 20 cents or a heifer for 32 and they were so enthusiastic about hope that on Tuesday night they would overflow the courtyard of Petra Coates, waiting for the moment when a child chosen by the he will randomly draw the winning number from the bag. That soon became a weekly fair, since from dusk tables of fritters and drink stalls were set up in the patio, and many of those favored sacrificed their livestock right there on the condition that others put on the music and brandy. So that without wanting to do so, Orleano Segundo suddenly found himself playing the accordion again and participating in modest tournaments of voracity. These humble replicas of the parandas of other days, served for Orleano Segundo himself to discover how much his spirits had fallen and to what extent his masterful cumbiambaro wit had dried up. He was a changed man. The 120 kilos that he had reached at the time when La Elefanta challenged him had been reduced to 78, his naive bloated tortoise face had turned into an iguana, and he was always close to boredom and exhaustion. For Petra Coates, however, he was never a better man than then, perhaps because she confused the compassion that he inspired in her with love, and the feeling of solidarity that misery had awakened in both of them. The dismantled bed ceased to be a place of lawlessness and became a haven of confidences. Freed from the repeating mirrors that they had auctioned off to buy raffle animals, and from the concupiscent apricots and velvets that the mule had eaten, they stayed up very late with the innocence of two awake grandparents, taking the opportunity to draw accounts and transfer pennies the time that before wasted and wasted. 
Sometimes the first roosters would surprise them making and undoing little piles of coins, removing a little from here to put it there, so that this would be enough to satisfy Fernanda, and that for Amaranta Ursula's shoes, and this another for Santa Sofia de la Pity that a suit had not been released since the time of noise, and this to have the drawer made if Ursula died, and this for the coffee that rose a penny per pound every three months, and this for the sugar that was sweetening less and less, and this for the firewood that was still wet from the flood, and this for the paper and the colored ink on the banknotes, and that which was left over to amortize the value of the April calf, from which they miraculously saved the leather because he gave him anthrax when almost all the raffle numbers were sold. Those masses of poverty were so pure, that they always destined the best part for Fernanda, and they never did it out of remorse or charity, but because her well-being mattered more to them than their own. What really happened to them, although neither of them realized it, was that they both thought of Fernanda as the daughter they wanted to have and did not have, to the point that on one occasion they resigned themselves to eating porridge for three days so that she could buy a Dutch tablecloth. However, no matter how hard they killed themselves working, no matter how much money they cheated and many tricks they conceived, the guardian angels fell asleep from exhaustion while they put in and took out coins trying to make them even enough to live. In the insomnia that bad accounts left them, they wondered what had happened in the world so that animals did not give birth with the same bewilderment as before why money was falling apart in their hands, and why people who had recently he burned bundles of bills in the Cumbiamba, he considered it an assault in an unpopulated area to charge 12 cents for the raffle of six chickens. Orleano Segundo thought without saying it that evil was not in the world, but in some hidden place in the mysterious heart of Petricoats, where something had happened during the flood that made the animals sterile and money elusive. Intrigued with this enigma, he delved so deeply into her feelings that by seeking interest he found love because by trying to make her love him he ended up loving her. Petra Coates, for her part, loved him more as her affection grew, and that was how, in the fullness of autumn, she returned to believe in the youthful superstition that poverty was a bondage of love. At that time, both evoked as a hindrance the wild parties, the spectacular wealth and the unbridled fornication, and lamented how much life it had cost them to find the paradise of shared solitude. Madly in love after so many years of sterile complicity, they enjoyed the miracle of loving each other both at the table and in bed, and they became so happy that even when they were two exhausted old men they continued to frolic like bunnies and fight like dogs. The raffles never gave for more. At first, Orleano Segundo spent three days of the week locked up in his old cattle rancher's office drawing ticket by ticket, painting with a certain delicacy a red cow, a green pig or a group of blue chickens, depending on the raffle animal, and with a good imitation of printed letters, she modeled the name that Petra Coates thought was good to baptize the business, Raffles of Divine Providence. But eventually he got so tired after drawing up to 2,000 bills a week that he had the animals, names and numbers made on rubber stamps, and then the work was reduced to moistening them on different colored pads. In their last years it occurred to them to substitute the numbers for riddles, so that the prize was distributed among all those who got it right, but the system turned out to be so complicated and lent itself to so many suspicions, that they gave up on the second attempt. Orleano Segundo was so busy trying to consolidate the prestige of his raffles, that he barely had time to see the children. Fernanda put Amaranta Ursula in a private school where no more than six students were received but he refused to allow Orleano attend public school. He considered that he had already given too much in accepting her to leave the room. In addition, in the schools of that time only legitimate children of Catholic couples were received, and in the birth certificate that they had caught with a nurse in Orleano's robe when they sent him home, he was registered as foundling. So he was locked up, at the mercy of the charitable surveillance of Santa Sofia de la Piedad and Ursula's mental alternatives discovering the narrow world of the house as the grandmothers explained it to him. He was fine, uptight, with a curiosity that unnerved adults, but contrary to the inquisitive and sometimes clairvoyant gaze the colonel had at his age, his was blinking and a little distracted. While Amaranta Ursula was in kindergarten, he hunted worms and tortured insects in the garden. But once Fernanda caught him putting scorpions in a box to put on Ursula's mat, she confined him to Meme's old bedroom 
where he distracted himself from his lonely hours by reviewing the encyclopedia pictures. Ursula found him there one afternoon when she was sprinkling the house with calm water and a bouquet of nettles, and despite the fact that she had been with him many times, she asked him who he was. I'm Orleano Buendia, he said. It's true, she replied. It's about time you started learning silverware. She confused him again with her son, because the warm wind that followed the flood and infused Isola's brain with occasional bursts of lucidity, had just passed. He did not regain his reason. When he entered the bedroom, he would find Petronilla Iguaran there, with the obtrusive crinoline and the beaded bag that she wore for engagement visits, and would find Tranquilina Maria Miniata Alacoc Buendia, her grandmother, fanning herself with a peacock feather on her rocking chair. Crippled, and his great-grandfather Orleano Arcadio Buendia with his false doorman of the viceregal guards, and Orleano Iguaran, his father, who had invented a prayer for the cowworms to burn and fall, and his timid mother, and the cousin with the pig's tail, and José Arcadio Buendia and his dead children, all sitting on chairs that had been leaned against the wall as if they were not on a visit, but at a wake. She wove a colorful chatter together, commenting on matters of remote places and times without coincidence, so that when Amaranta Ursula returned from school and Orleano got tired of the encyclopedia, they would find her sitting on the bed, talking alone, and lost in a labyrinth of dead. Fire. She screamed once in terror, and for an instant it spread panic in the house, but what she was announcing was the burning of a stable that she had witnessed at the age of four. He came to mix the past with the present in such a way that in the two or three bursts of lucidity he had before he died, no one knew for sure if he was talking about what he felt or what he remembered. Little by little it was reduced, fetishized, mummified in life, to the point that in its last months it was a prune lost inside the nightgown, and the arm always raised ended up looking like the leg of a marimonda. She would remain motionless for several days, and Santa Sofia de la Piedad had to shake her to convince herself that she was alive, and she would sit her on her legs to feed her with teaspoons of sugar water. She looked like a newborn old woman. Amaranta Ursula and Orleano took her and brought her through the bedroom, they laid her on the altar to see that she was barely bigger than the child god, and one afternoon they hid her in a closet in the barn where the rats could have eaten her. One Palm Sunday they entered the bedroom while Fernanda was at Mass, and they carried Ursula by the neck and ankles. Poor great-great-grandmother, said Amaranta Ursula, she died of old age. Ursula was startled. I'm alive. He said. You see, said Amaranta Ursula, suppressing her laughter, she isn't even breathing. I'm talking. Ursula yelled. He doesn't even speak, Orleano said. He died like a cricket. Then Ursula surrendered to the evidence. My God, he exclaimed in a low voice. So this is death. He began an endless prayer, hasty, deep, that lasted for more than two days, and that on Tuesday had degenerated into a jumble of supplication to God and practical advice so that the fire ants would not knock down the house, so that they would never let them turn off. The lamp in front of the daguerreotype of Remedios, and so that they would take care that no Buendia would marry someone of the same blood, because children were born with pig's tails. Orleano Segundo tried to take advantage of the delirium to make him confess where the buried gold was, but once again the pleas were useless. When the owner appears, said Ursula, God has to enlighten him to find him. Santa Sofia de la Piedad had the certainty that she would find her dead at any moment, because in those days she observed a certain bewilderment of nature, that the roses smelled of canopodio that a chickpea totuma fell off and the grains remained in the ground in a perfect geometric order and in the shape of a starfish, and that one night he saw a row of luminous orange discs pass through the sky. She woke up dead on Holy Thursday. The last time she had been helped to count her age, in the days of the banana company, she had calculated it between 115 and 122 years of age. They buried her in a little box that was barely larger than the basket in which Orleano was carried, and very few people attended the funeral, partly because not many remembered her, and partly because it was so hot that noon that the disoriented birds crashed like buckshot against the walls and broke the metal screens of the windows to die in the bedrooms. 
At first it was believed to be a plague. The housewives were exhausted from sweeping up dead birds, especially at siesta time, and the men threw them into the river by cartloads. On Resurrection Sunday, the Centennial Father Antonio Isabel affirmed in the pulpit that the death of the birds was due to the bad influence of the wandering Jew, whom he himself had seen the night before. She described him as a hybrid male goat crossed with female heretic, an infernal beast whose breath scorched the air and whose visit would determine the conception of spawns by the newlyweds. There were not many who paid attention to his apocalyptic talk, because the people were convinced that the parish priest was delirious because of age but a woman woke everyone up at dawn on Wednesday, because she found some footprints of a split-hoofed biped. They were so true and unmistakable that those who went to see them did not doubt the existence of a hideous creature similar to the one described by the parish priest, and they joined forces to set traps in their yards. That was how they achieved the capture. Two weeks after Ursula's death, Petra Coates and Orleano Segundo woke up startled by a huge calf cry that came from the neighborhood. When they got up, already a group of men was unthreading the monster from the sharp poles that had stopped at the bottom of a pit covered with dry leaves, and it had stopped howling. He weighed like an ox, even though he was no taller than an adolescent, and his wounds oozed greasy green blood. His body was covered with rough fur, riddled with tiny ticks, and his skin petrified by a remorous gab, but contrary to the priest's description, his human parts were more like a valetudinary angel than a man because his hands were smooth and skillful, the eyes large and crepuscular, and on his shoulder blades he had the scarred and calloused stumps of powerful wings, which must have been roughened with plowman's axes. They hung him by the ankles in an almond tree in the square, so that no one would be left without seeing him and when he began to rot they burned him in a bonfire, because it could not be determined if his bastard nature was that of an animal to throw into the river or of a Christian to bury. It was never established if it was in fact because of him that the birds died, but the newlyweds did not conceive the announced monsters, nor did the intensity of the heat diminish. Rebecca died at the end of that year. Argenita, her lifelong maid, asked the authorities for help to knock down the bedroom door where her employer had been locked up for three days, and they found her in the lonely bed, curled up like a shrimp, her head peeled off by ringworm and the thumb stuck in the mouth. Orleano Segundo took charge of the burial, and tried to restore the house to sell it, but the destruction was so fierce on it that the walls were chipping when just painted, and there was no mortar thick enough to prevent the weeds from crushing the floors and the ivy would rot the pitchforks. Everything was like this since the flood. The laziness of the people contrasted with the voracity of oblivion, which little by little was eating away memories mercilessly, to the point that at that time, on a new anniversary of the Nirlandia Treaty, emissaries of the President of the Republic to finally deliver the decoration several times rejected by Colonel Orleano Buendia, and they lost an entire afternoon looking for someone to show them where they could find some of their descendants. Orleano Segundo was tempted to receive it, believing it to be a solid gold medal, but Petra Coates persuaded him of the indignity when the emissaries were already preparing sides and speeches for the ceremony. Also around that time the gypsies returned, the last heirs of Melchiades' science, and found the town so finished and its inhabitants so far removed from the rest of the world, that they returned to get into the houses dragging magnetized irons as if they were really the last discovery of the Babylonian sages, and they refocused the sun's rays with the gigantic magnifying glass, and there were many who stood with their mouths open watching pots fall and cauldrons roll, and those who paid fifty. Sense to be amazed by a gypsy who took off and stood I put on the false teeth. A rickety yellow train that did not bring or take anyone, and that hardly stopped at the deserted station, was the only thing that remained of the crowded train in which Mr. Brown hooked his car with a glass roof and bishop's armchairs, and of the fruit trains of 120 wagons that lingered for an entire afternoon. The curial delegates who had gone to investigate the report on the strange death of the birds and the sacrifice of the wandering Jew, found Father Antonio Isabel playing blind man's game with the children, and believing that his report was the product of a senile hallucination, they took him to a nursing home. Shortly after they sent Father Augusto Angel, a crusader from the New Hornadas, uncompromising, daring, reckless, who personally rang the bell several times a day so that the spirits would not be lethargic, 
and who would go from house to house waking up the sleepers to that they went to mass, but within a year he was also overcome by the negligence that was breathed in the air, by the burning dust that aged and clogged everything, and by the drowsiness caused by the lunch dumplings and the unbearable heat of the nap. On the death of Ursula, the house fell into an abandonment from which it could not be rescued even by a will as resolute and vigorous as that of Amaranta Ursula, who many years later, being a woman without prejudice, cheerful and modern, with his feet firmly grounded in the world, he opened doors and windows to scare away ruin, restored the garden, exterminated the fire ants that were already roaming the corridor in broad daylight, and tried in vain to awaken the forgotten spirit of hospitality. Fernanda's cloistered passion laid an insurmountable dam after Ursula's torrential hundred years. Not only did he refuse to open the doors when the arid wind passed, but he also had the windows closed with wooden cross pieces, obeying the father's slogan to bury himself alive. The expensive correspondence with the invisible doctors ended in failure. After many postponements, she shut herself up in her bedroom at the agreed date and time, covered only by a white sheet and with her head to the north, and at one o'clock in the morning she felt that her face was covered with a handkerchief soaked in a glacial liquid. When she woke up, the sun was shining on the window and she had a barbaric arched seam that started at the groin and ended at the sternum. But before she fulfilled her planned rest, she received a bewildered letter from the invisible doctors, who claimed to have searched her for six hours without finding anything that corresponded to the symptoms so many times and so scrupulously described by her. In fact, her pernicious habit of not calling things by their names had created a new confusion, since all the telepathic surgeons found was a descent of the uterus that could be corrected with the use of a pessary. The disillusioned Fernanda tried to obtain more precise information, but the CO unknown correspondents did not reply to his letters. She felt so weighed down by the weight of an unfamiliar word that she decided to gag her shame to ask what a pessary was, and only then did she learn that the French doctor had hung himself from a beam three months earlier, and had been buried against the will of the man town by a former comrade in arms of Colonel Orleano Buendia. Then her son José Arcadio was entrusted, and he sent her the pessaries from Rome, with an explanatory brochure that she threw down the toilet after learning it by heart, so that no one would know the nature of her losses. It was a useless precaution, because the only people who lived in the house hardly took it into account. Santa Sofia de la Piedad wandered in a lonely old age, cooking what little was eaten and almost entirely dedicated to the care of José Arcadio Segundo. Amaranta Ursula, heir to certain charms of Remedios, La Bella, used to do her homework the time that she used to lose in tormenting Ursula, and she began to show good judgment and a dedication to studies that made Orleano Segundo reborn the good hope that Mim inspired him. He had promised to send her to finish her studies in Brussels, in accordance with a custom established in the days of the Banana Company and that illusion had led him to try to revive the lands devastated by the flood. The few times he was seen in the house then, it was because of Amaranta Ursula, because over time he had become a stranger to Fernanda, and little Orleano was becoming elusive and self-absorbed as he approached puberty. Orleano Segundo hoped that old age would soften Fernanda's heart, so that the boy could join the life of a town where surely no one would have bothered to make suspicious speculations about his origin. But Orleano himself seemed to prefer confinement and solitude, and did not reveal the slightest malice for knowing the world that began at the front door. When Ursula opened Melchiada's room, he began to haunt him, to peer through the ajar door, and no one knew when he ended up being linked to José Arcadio Segundo out of mutual affection. Orleano Segundo discovered this friendship long after it began, when he heard the boy talking about the massacre at the station. It happened one day when someone at the table lamented the ruin that the town sank into when the banana company abandoned it, and Orleano contradicted him with the maturity and the variability of an older person. His point of view, contrary to the general interpretation, was that Macondo was a prosperous and well-run place until it disordered and corrupted and squeezed the calm banana company, whose engineers caused the deluge as a pretext to evade commitments with the workers. Speaking with such good judgment that it seemed to Fernanda a sacrilegious parody of Jesus among the doctors, the boy described with precise and convincing detail how the army machine gunned more than 3,000 cornered workers at the station, 
and how they loaded the corpses onto a train of 200 wagons and threw them into the sea. Convinced like most people of the official truth that nothing had happened, Fernando was shocked by the idea that the boy had inherited the anarchist instincts of Colonel Orleano Buendia, and ordered him to shut up. Orleano Segundo, on the other hand, acknowledged seeing Zion of his twin brother. In fact, despite the fact that everyone thought him crazy, José Arcadio Segundo was at that time the most lucid inhabitant of the house. He taught little Orleano to read and write, started him in the study of parchments, and instilled in him such a personal interpretation of what the Banana Company meant to Macondo that many years later, when Orleano joined the world, he had to think that he told a hallucinated version, because it was radically contrary to the false one that historians had admitted, and enshrined in school textbooks. In the secluded little room, where the arid wind, the dust and the heat never reached, they both remembered the atavistic vision of an old man in a raven's hat who spoke of the world behind the window, many years before they were born. Both discovered at the same time that it was always March there and it was always Monday, and then they understood that José Arcadio Buendía was not as crazy as the family had said, but that he was the only one who had had enough lucidity to glimpse the truth that also the time suffered stumbling and accidents, and could therefore splinter and leave an eternal fraction in a room. José Arcadio Segundo had also managed to classify the cryptic letters on the scrolls. He was sure that they corresponded to an alphabet of 47 to 53 characters, that separated they looked like little spiders and ticks, and that in Melchiada's exquisite handwriting they looked like pieces of clothing put to dry on a wire. Orleano remembered having seen a similar table in the English Encyclopedia, so he took it to the room to compare it with that of José Arcadio Segundo. They were the same, indeed. Around the time he came up with the guessing lottery, Orleano Segundo woke up with a lump in his throat, as if he were suppressing the urge to cry. Petra Coates interpreted it as one of the many disorders caused by the bad situation, and every morning for more than a year, she touched his palate with a honey swab and gave him radish syrup. When the lump in his throat became so oppressive that it was difficult for him to breathe, Orleano Segundo visited Pilar Turnera in case she knew of any herbs for relief. The unwavering grandmother, who had reached 100 years in charge of a clandestine brothel, did not trust therapeutic superstitions, but consulted the matter with the cards. He saw the golden horse with its throat wound by the steel of the Jack of Swords, and deduced that Fernanda was trying to get the husband back to the house by means of the discredited system of driving pins into his portrait, but that it had caused a tumor. Internal by a clumsy knowledge of his bad arts. As Orleano Segundo had no other portraits other than those of the wedding, and the copies were complete in the family album, he continued to search the house for the carelessness of the wife, and finally found half a dozen pessaries in the back of the wardrobe in their original boxes. Believing that the red rubber rings were objects of sorcery, he put one in his pocket for Pilar Turnera to see. She could not determine its nature, but it seemed so suspicious to her that she had the half dozen taken anyway and burned it in a bonfire that she lit in the courtyard. To ward off Fernanda's supposed curse, he told Orleano Segundo to wet a broody hen and bury it alive under the chestnut tree, and he did it in such good faith that when he finished hiding the removed earth with dry leaves, he already felt that he breathed better. For her part, Fernanda interpreted the disappearance as a reprisal by the invisible doctors, and a drawstring pouch was sewn on the inside of her camisole, where she kept the new pessaries that her son sent her. Six months after the burial of the hen, Orleano Segundo woke up at midnight with a fit of coughing, and feeling that he was being strangled from the inside with crab claws. It was then that he realized that no matter how many magical pessaries he destroyed and many spell chickens he soaked, the only sad truth was that he was dying. He didn't tell anyone. Tormented by the fear of dying without sending Amaranta Ursula to Brussels, she worked as she had never done, and instead of one she held three weekly raffles. From very early on you could see him roaming the town, even in the most remote and miserable neighborhoods, trying to sell the tickets with an anxiety that was only conceivable in a dying person. Here is divine providence, he cried. Don't let her go, it only comes once in a hundred years. He made moving efforts to appear cheerful, friendly, talkative, 
but it was enough to see his sweat and paleness to know that he could not with his soul. Sometimes he would detour into vacant lots, where no one would see him, and he would sit for a moment to rest from the pincers that were tearing him apart from the inside. Still at midnight I was in the neighborhood of tolerance, trying to comfort with pre-good luck to the lonely women who wept by the Victrolas. This number hasn't been out for four months, he would tell them, showing them the tickets. Don't let it go, life is shorter than you think. They ended up losing respect for him, making fun of him, and in his last months they no longer called him Don Orleano, as they had always done, but instead called him Don Divina Providencia to their own face. His voice was filling with false notes, it became unsteady and eventually faded into a dog's snore, but he still had the will not to let the expectation for the prizes in the courtyard of Petra Coates wane. However, as she lost her voice and realized that in a short time she could no longer bear the pain, she realized that it was not with raffled pigs and goats that her daughter would arrive in Brussels, so she conceived the idea of make the fabulous raffle of the lands destroyed by the flood which could well be restored by whoever had the capital. It was such a spectacular initiative that the mayor himself lent himself to announce it with one side, and companies were formed to buy tickets for 100 pesos each, which were sold out in less than a week. On the night of the raffle, the winners threw a spectacular party, comparable only to those of the good old days of the Banana Company, and Orleano Segundo played the forgotten songs of Francisco El Hombre on the accordion for the last time but he could no longer sing them. Two months later, Amaranta Ursula went to Brussels. Orleano Segundo gave him not only the money from the extraordinary raffle, but also the money he had managed to save in the previous months, and the very little money he obtained from the sale of the pianola, the harpsichord, and other disgraced corrados. According to his calculations, that fund was enough for his studies, so only the value of the return ticket remained pending. Fernanda opposed the trip until the last moment, scandalized by the idea that Brussels was so close to the doom of Paris, but was reassured by a letter Father Angel gave her for a pension for young Catholics run by nuns, where Amaranta Ursula promised to live until the end of her studies. In addition, the parish priest got her to travel in the care of a group of Franciscan women who were going to Toledo, where they hoped to find trustworthy people to send her to Belgium. While the hasty correspondence that made this coordination possible was advancing, Orleano Segundo, helped by Petra Coates, took care of Amaranta Ursula's luggage. The night they prepared one of Fernanda's bridal trunks, things were so well arranged that the student knew by heart which were the corduroy suits and slippers with which she had to make the crossing of the Atlantic, and the blue cloth coat with copper buttons, and the cordovan shoes with which he had to disembark. He also knew how he should walk so as not to fall into the water when he came aboard the platform, that at no time should he separate from the nuns or leave the cabin other than to eat, and that for no reason should he answer the questions asked. Acquaintances of any sex made him on the high seas. He carried a small bottle with drops for seasickness and a notebook written in his own hand by Father Angel, with six prayers to ward off the storm. Fernanda made him a canvas bell to hold the money and showed him how to wear it tight to the body, so that he would not have to take it off even to sleep. She tried to give her the gold potty washed with bleach and disinfected with alcohol, but Amaranta Ursula rejected it for fear that her classmates would make fun of her. A few months later, at the time of death, Orleano Segundo had to remember her as he saw her last time, trying unsuccessfully to get off the dusty glass of the second-class carriage, to listen to Fernanda's latest recommendations. She wore a pink silk gown with a sprig of artificial pansies on the left shoulder clasp, the cordovan shoes with loops and low heels, and the satin stockings with elastic garters on the calves. She had a small body, long, loose hair, and lively eyes that Ursula had at her age, and the way she said goodbye without crying but without smiling, revealed the same strength of character. Walking alongside the wagon as it accelerated, and leading Fernanda by the arm so that she would not stumble, Orleano Segundo could barely reciprocate with a wave of her hand, when the daughter sent her a kiss with the tips of her fingers. The couple stood motionless in the scorching sun, watching the train blend into the black dot of the horizon, arm in arm for the first time since the wedding day. On August 9, before the first letter from Brussels was received, 
Jose Arcadio Segundo was talking with Orleano in Melquiades room, and without his coming he said. Always remember that there were more than three thousand and that they were thrown into the sea. Then he fell flat on the scrolls, and died with his eyes open. At that very moment, in Fernanda's bed, her twin brother reached the end of the long and terrible martyrdom of the iron crabs that ate at his throat. A week before, he had returned home, voiceless, breathless, and almost bare bones, with his transhuman trunks and his perdulario accordion, to fulfill his promise to die with his wife. Petra Coates helped him gather his clothes and dismissed him without shedding a tear, but forgot to give him the patent leather shoes that he wanted to wear in the coffin. So when he learned that he was dead, he dressed in black, wrapped the boots in a newspaper, and asked Fernanda's permission to see the body. Fernanda did not let her pass the door. Put yourself in my place, Petra Coates pleaded. Imagine how much I have wanted him to endure this humiliation. There is no humiliation that a concubine does not deserve. Fernanda replied. So wait for another one to die to put those booties on him. In fulfillment of her promise, Santa Sofia de la Piedad slaughtered the corpse of José Arcadio Segundo with a kitchen knife to ensure that he was not buried alive. The bodies were placed in identical coffins, and there it was seen that they were identical again in death, as they were until adolescence. Orleano Segundo's old party companions put a crown on his box that had a purple ribbon with a sign Get away stand back cows that life is short. Fernanda was so outraged by the irreverence that she had the crown thrown in the trash. In the last minute riot, the sad drunks who carried them out of the house mistook the coffins and buried them in the wrong graves. Orleano did not leave Melchiades's room for a long time. He memorized the fantastic legends of the Unbound Book, the synthesis of Hermann's studies, the cripple, the notes on demonological science, the keys to the philosopher's stone, the centuries of Nostradamus and his research on the plague, so that he reached adolescence without knowing anything about his time but with the basic knowledge of medieval man. At any time that he entered the room, Santa Sofia de la Piedad found him absorbed in reading. At dawn I would bring him a cup of coffee without sugar, and at noon a plate of rice with fried slices of banana, which was the only thing that was eaten in the house after the death of Orleano Segundo. He worried about cutting his hair, removing the knits, adapting the old clothes that he found in forgotten trunks, and when his mustache began to grow, he brought him the Barbara razor and the Totumata for the foam of Colonel Orleano Buendia. None of his sons resembled him so much, not even Orleano Jose, especially because of his pronounced cheekbones, and the determined and a bit ruthless line of his lips. As happened to Ursula with Orleano Segundo when he was studying in the room, Santa Sofia de la Piedad believed that Orleano spoke alone. Actually, he was talking to Melchiades. One fiery noon, Shortly after the death of the twins, he saw the gloomy old man in the raven-brimmed hat against the reverberation of the window, like the materialization of a memory that had been in his memory long before he was born. Orleano had finished classifying the alphabet on the scrolls. So when Melchiades asked him if he had discovered in what language they were written, he did not hesitate to answer. In Sanskrit, he said. Melchiades revealed to him that his chances of returning to the room were numbered. But he went quietly to the meadows of final death, because Orleano had time to learn Sanskrit in the years until the scrolls were a century old and could be deciphered. It was he who told her that in the alley that ended in the river, and where in the days of the Banana Company the future was guessed and dreams were interpreted, a Catalan wise man had a bookstore where there was a Sanskrit primer that would be devoured for the moth six years later if he didn't rush to buy it. For the first time in her long life, Santa Sofia de la Piedad revealed a feeling, and it was a feeling of amazement, when Orleano asked her to bring him the book that was to be found between the liberated Jerusalem and the poems of Milton, in the extreme right of the second row of the shelves. Since she could not read, she learned the parade by heart, and got the money from the sale of one of the seventeen goldfish that remained in the workshop and that only she and Orleano knew where they had put them the night the soldiers they searched the house. Orleano progressed in his studies of Sanskrit, while Melchiades became less and less assiduous and more distant, fading into the radiant clarity of noon. The last time Orleano felt it, 
it was just an invisible presence murmuring, I have died of fever in the dunes of Singapore. The room was then made vulnerable to dust, heat, termites, fire ants, and moths that were to turn the wisdom of books and scrolls into sawdust. There was no shortage of what to eat in the house. The day after the death of Orleano Segundo, one of the friends who had worn the crown with the irreverent inscription offered to pay Fernanda some money that she owed to her husband. From then on, an errand boy carried a basket with things to eat every Wednesday, which would last well for a week. No one ever knew that those supplies were sent by Petra Coates, with the idea that continued charity was a way to humiliate those who had humiliated her. However, the resentment dissipated much sooner than she had expected, and then she continued to send the food out of pride and finally out of compassion. Several times, when she lacked the courage to sell tickets and people lost interest in the raffles, she did not eat for Fernanda to eat, and she did not stop fulfilling the commitment until she saw her funeral pass. For Santa Sofia de la Piedad, the reduction of the inhabitants of the house should have been the rest to which she was entitled after more than half a century of work. Never had a lament been heard from that stealthy, impenetrable woman, who sowed the angelic germs of Remedios, the beauty and the mysterious solemnity of José Arcadio Segundo in the family, that she devoted a lifetime of solitude and silence to raising children who barely remembered that they were her children and grandchildren, and that she took care of Orleano as if he had come out of her womb, without knowing herself that he was his great-grandmother. Only in a house like this was it conceivable that she would have always slept on a mat that she spread on the barn floor, amid the nocturnal din of rats, and without having told anyone that one night she was awakened by the terrifying sensation that someone was her. Looking in the dark, and it was that a viper was slipping through his belly. She knew that if she had told Ursula about it, she would have put her to sleep in her own bed, but those were the times when no one noticed anything until she was yelling at herself in the corridor, because the anxieties of the bakery, the frights of the war, the care of children, did not leave time to think about the happiness of others. Petra Coates, whom he never saw, was the only one who remembered her. He was making sure he had a good pair of shoes to go out with, that he would never be short of a suit, even in the days when they worked miracles with raffle money. When Fernanda arrived at the house, she had reason to believe that she was an eternal servant, and although several times she heard that she was her husband's mother, it was so incredible that it took her longer to know it than to forget it. Santa Sofia de la Piedad never seemed to be bothered by that subaltern condition. On the contrary, one had the impression that he liked to walk around the corners, without a truce, without a complaint, keeping the immense house where he had lived since adolescence tidy and clean, and that particularly in the days of the banana company he seemed more like a barracks than a home. But when Ursula died, the inhuman diligence of Santa Sofia de la Piedad, her tremendous capacity for work, began to break down. It wasn't just that she was old and worn out, but that the house fell overnight into a crisis of senility. A tender moss crawled up the walls. When there was no longer a bare spot in the patios, the undergrowth broke the concrete of the corridor underneath, cracked it like glass, and the same little yellow flowers came out through the cracks that almost a century before Ursula had found in the glass where the Melchiadas false teeth. Without time or resources to prevent the outrages of nature, Santa Sofia de la Piedad spent the day in the bedrooms, scaring away the lizards that would come back at night. One morning he saw the fire ants leave the undermined foundations, crossed the garden, climbed the banister where the begonias had turned earth-colored, and entered the back of the house. He tried first to kill them with a broom, then with insecticide and finally with lime, but the next day they were again in the same place always passing by, tenacious and invincible. Fernanda, writing letters to her children, did not realize the irrepressible onslaught of destruction. Santa Sofia de la Piedad continued to fight alone, fighting with the undergrowth to prevent it from entering the kitchen, tearing the cobweb tassels that would reproduce in a few hours from the walls, scraping the termites. But when he saw that Melchiada's room was also cobwebbed and dusty, he swept and shaken it three times a day, and that despite his cleaning fury he was threatened by the rubble and the air of misery that only Colonel Orleano Buendia and the young military man had foreseen, he understood that he was defeated. 
Then she put on her worn Sunday dress, some old Ursula shoes, and a pair of cotton stockings that Amaranta Ursula had given her, and made a bundle with the two or three changes she had left. I give up, he told Orleano. This is a lot of home for my poor bones. Orleano asked her where she was going, and she made a vague gesture, as if she had no idea of her destination. He tried to specify, however, that he was going to spend his last years with a first cousin who lived in Riahatcha. It was not a credible explanation. Since the death of his parents, he had not had contact with anyone in the village, nor did he receive letters or messages, nor was he heard to speak of a relative. Orleano gave her fourteen little gold fishes, because she was willing to leave with the only thing she had, one peso and twenty-five cents. From the bedroom window, he saw her walking across the patio with her bundle of clothes, shuffling and arched over the years, and he saw her reach through a hole in the gate to put the latch on after she had left. She was never heard from again. When she found out about the escape, Fernanda ranted a whole day, while going through trunks, dressers, and cabinets, thing by thing, to convince herself that Santa Sofia de la Piedad had not taken anything. He burned his fingers trying to light a stove for the first time in his life, and had to ask Orleano for the favor of teaching him how to make coffee. In time, it was he who did the kitchen chores. When she got up, Fernanda found breakfast served, and she only left the bedroom again to take the food that Orleano left her covered in embers, and that she brought to the table to eat on linen tablecloths and among chandeliers, sitting on a solitary headboard. At the end of fifteen empty chairs. Even under these circumstances, Orleano and Fernanda did not share their loneliness, but each continued to live in their own, cleaning the respective room, while the cobweb was snowing the rose bushes, upholstering the beams, padding the walls. It was around this time that Fernanda had the impression that the house was filling with goblins. It was as if objects, especially everyday objects, had developed the ability to change places on their own. Fernanda was running out of time to find the scissors that she was sure she had put on the bed and, after shuffling everything, she found them on a kitchen shelf, where she thought she hadn't been in four days. Suddenly there was no fork in the cutlery drawer and he found six on the altar and three in the laundry room. That walk of things was most exasperating when he sat down to write. The inkwell that he put on the right appeared on the left, the blotting paper pad was lost, and he found it two days later under the pillow, and the pages written to Jose Arcadio were confused with those of Amaranta Ursula, and always he walked with the mortification of having put the letters in changed envelopes, as indeed happened several times. On one occasion he lost his pen. Fifteen days later the postman who had found it in his bag returned it to him, and he was looking for the owner of the house at home. At first, she believed that they were things of the invisible doctors, like the disappearance of the pessaries, and even began to write them a letter to beg them to leave her alone, but she had had to interrupt her to do something, and when she returned to the room she did not only did not find the letter started, but forgot the purpose of writing it. For a time he thought it was Orleano. He began to watch over him, to put objects in his path, trying to surprise him the moment he moved them, but very soon he was convinced that Orleano was not leaving Melchiada's room except to go to the kitchen or the toilet, and that he was not a man of mockery. So he ended up believing that they were goblin shenanigans, and chose to secure each item where it was to be used. He tied the scissors with a long string at the head of the bed. He tied the feather duster and blotter pad to the table leg, and glued the inkwell to the table to the right of where he used to write. The problems were not solved from one day to the next, because after a few hours of sewing and the blade of the scissors was not enough to cut, as if the elves were reducing it. The same thing happened to him with the whistle of the pen, and even with his own arm, which shortly after he was writing he did not reach the inkwell. Neither Amaranta Ursula, in Brussels, nor Jose Arcadio, in Rome, ever found out about these insignificant misfortunes. Fernanda told them that she was happy, and in reality she was, precisely because she felt liberated from all commitment, as if life had dragged her back to her parents' world, where she did not suffer with daily problems because they were resolved in advance in the imagination. 
That interminable correspondence made him lose track of time, especially after Santa Bofia de la Piedad left. He had gotten used to Tumberdu to keep track of the days, months, and years, taking as reference points the dates scheduled for the return of the children. But when they modified the deadlines over and over again, the dates were confused, the terms were misplaced, and the days were so similar to each other that they did not feel like they were passing. Instead of being impatient, he was deeply pleased with the delay. It did not disturb her that many years after announcing the eve of her perpetual vows, Jose Arcadio continued to say that he hoped to finish his studies in high theology to undertake diplomacy, because she understood that the spiral staircase that led to it was very tall and paved with obstacles. It led to the chair of St. Peter. Instead, his spirit was exalted with news that others would have been insignificant, such as that his son had seen the Pope. He experienced a similar joy when Amaranta Ursula sent him to say that his studies were taking longer than the expected time, because his excellent grades had earned him privileges that his father did not take into account when doing the math. More than three years had passed since Santa Sofia de la Piedad took the grammar to him, when Orleano managed to translate the first sheet. It was not a useless task, but it was only a first step on a path whose length was impossible to foresee, because the text in Spanish did not mean anything, they were encrypted verses. Orleano lacked elements to establish the keys that would allow him to unravel them, but since Melchiades had told him that the Catalan wise man's shop had the books he would need to get to the bottom of the scrolls, he decided to speak with Fernanda to let him go to look for them. In the room devoured by rubble, whose uncontrollable proliferation had ended up defeating him, he thought about the most appropriate way to formulate the request, anticipated the circumstances, calculated the most appropriate occasion, but when he found Fernanda removing the food from the embers, that it was the only chance to speak to him, the painstakingly premeditated request was choking him, and his voice was lost. That was the only time he spied on her. I was watching her footsteps in the bedroom. He heard her go to the door to receive her children's letters and deliver hers to the postman, and he listened late into the night the hard and passionate stroke of the pen on the paper, before hearing the noise of the switch and the murmur of prayers in the dark. Only then did he fall asleep, trusting that tomorrow would give him the expected opportunity. He was so excited about the idea that permission would not be denied that one morning he cut off his shoulder hair, shaved off his tangled beard, put on tight pants and a shirt with a false collar that he didn't know about. Who had inherited, and waited in the kitchen for Fernanda to go to breakfast. The woman of every day did not arrive, the one with the raised head and the stony gait, but an old woman of supernatural beauty, with a yellowish ermine cape, a golden cardboard crown, and the languid demeanor of someone who has secretly wept. In fact, since she found it in Orleano Segundo's trunks, Fernanda had worn the moth-eaten queen's dress many times. Anyone who had seen her in front of the mirror, ecstatic in her own monarchical gestures, might have thought that she was crazy. But it wasn't. Merely, he had turned royal outfits into a memory machine. The first time she put them on, she could not prevent a knot from forming in her heart and her eyes filling with tears, because at that moment she again perceived the smell of shoe polish from the boots of the military man who came to look for her. Her home to make her queen, and her soul crystallized with nostalgia for lost dreams. She felt so old, so finished, so distant from the best hours of her life that she even longed for the ones she remembered as the worst, and only then did she discover how much the oregano blasts were missing in the corridor, and the steam from the rose bushes outside. Dusk, and even the beastly nature of the upstarts. His heart of caked ash that had resisted without failures the most accurate blows of everyday reality, crumbled at the first attacks of nostalgia. The need to feel sad became a vice as the years ravaged her. He became human in solitude. However, the morning she entered the kitchen to find a cup of coffee offered to her by a pale, bony adolescent with a hallucinatory gleam in his eyes, she was ripped open by ridicule. Not only did he deny her permission, but he has ever since loaded the house keys into the bag where he kept the unused pessaries. It was a useless precaution, because if Orleano had wanted to, he could have escaped and even returned home without being seen. But the prolonged captivity, 
the uncertainty of the world, the habit of obeying, had dried the seeds of rebellion in his heart. So he went back to his closure, going through and going over the scrolls, and hearing Fernanda's sobs in the bedroom late into the night. One morning she went as usual to light the stove, and found in the extinguished ashes the food that she had left for her the day before. Then he looked into the bedroom, and saw her lying on the bed, covered with the ermine cloak, more beautiful than ever, and with her skin turned into an ivory shell. Four months later, when José Arcadio arrived, he found it intact. It was impossible to conceive of a man more like his mother. He wore a mournful taffeta suit, a stiff, round-necked shirt, and a thin silk ribbon with a bow in place of the tie. He was livid, languid, with astonished eyes and weak lips. The sleek, smooth black hair, parted in the center of the skull by a straight, bloodless line, had the same false appearance as the hair of the saints. The shadow of the severed beard on the paraffin face seemed a matter of conscience. His hands were pale, with green veins and parasitic fingers, and a solid gold ring with a round sunflower opal on the left index finger. When he opened the door to Orleano Street for him, he would not have had to guess who he was to realize that he had come from far away. The house was impregnated as he passed by the fragrance of flowery water that Ursula put on his head when he was a child, to be able to find it in the darkness. Somehow impossible to specify, after so many years of absence, José Arcadio was still an autumnal child, terribly sad and lonely. He went directly to his mother's bedroom, where Orleano had vaporized mercury for four months in the atanner of his grandfather's grandfather, to preserve the body according to the Melchiades formula. José Arcadio did not ask any questions. She kissed the corpse on the forehead took the drawstring pouch from under her skirt where there were three pessaries still unused, and the key to the wardrobe. He did everything with direct and determined gestures, in contrast to his languor. From the wardrobe he took out a small damascened box with the family crest, and found inside the sandalwood-scented interior the voluminous letter in which Fernanda unburdened her heart to the countless truths that she had hidden from her. He read it standing, eagerly but without anxiety and on the third page he stopped, and examined Orleano with a look of second recognition. So, he said in a voice that had something of a razor to it, you're the bastard. I am Orleano Buendia. Go to your room, José Arcadio said. Orleano left, and did not come out again, even out of curiosity when he heard the rumor of solitary funerals. Sometimes, from the kitchen, I would see José Arcadio wandering around the house, now gasping on his longing breath, and he kept hearing his footsteps through the ruined bedrooms after midnight. He had not heard her voice for many months, not only because José Arcadio did not speak to him, but because he had no desire for it to happen, nor time to think about anything other than the scrolls. When Fernanda died, he had taken out the penultimate little fish and had gone to the bookstore of the Catalan wise man in search of the books he needed. He was not interested in anything he saw on the way, perhaps because he had no memories to compare, and the deserted streets and desolate houses were the same as he had imagined at a time when he would have given his soul to know them. He had granted himself the permission that Fernanda denied him, and only once, with a single objective and for the minimum necessary time, so he walked without pause the eleven blocks that separated the house from the alley where dreams were previously interpreted, and walked into the motley and gloomy place where there was hardly room to move. More than a bookstore, it looked like a dump of used books, thrown into disarray on the termite jagged shelves, in the cobwebbed corners, and even in the spaces that must have been destined for the corridors. At a long table, also burdened with monstrosities, the owner wrote tireless prose, with purple calligraphy, a bit delirious, and on loose leaves from a school notebook. He had beautiful silver hair that came forward like a cockatoo's plume on his forehead, and his vivid, narrow blue eyes revealed the meekness of the man who has read all the books. He was in his underpants, drenched in sweat, and he did not ignore the writing to see who had arrived. Orleano had no difficulty in rescuing the five books he was looking for from that fabled disorder, since they were in the exact place that Melchiades had indicated. Without saying a word, he handed them along with the goldfish to the Catalan sage, and he examined them, 
and his eyelids twitched like two clams. You must be crazy, he said in his language, shrugging his shoulders, and handed Orleano the five books and the little fish. Take it away, he said in Spanish. The last man to read those books must have been Isaac the Blind, so think carefully about what you do. Jose Arcadio restored Meme's bedroom, had the velvet curtains and damask on the canopy of the viceregal bed cleaned and patched, and put the abandoned bathroom back into service, whose cement pool was blackened by a fibrous and rough cream. It was to these two places that his empire of junk, of worn-out exotic goods, of fake perfumes and cheap jewels was reduced. The only thing that seemed to hinder him in the rest of the house were the saints on the domestic altar, which he burned to ash one afternoon in a bonfire that he lit in the courtyard. He slept until after eleven. He would go to the bathroom wearing a frayed golden dragon tunic and yellow tasseled slippers, and there he would officiate a rite that, due to its parsimony and duration, was reminiscent of that of Remedios, the beauty. Before bathing, he scented the pool with the salts that he carried in three basted pots. He did not do ablutions with the totuma, but plunged into the fragrant waters, and remained up to two hours floating on his back, numbed by the freshness and by the memory of Amaranta. A few days after arriving, she abandoned the taffeta dress, which in addition to being too hot for the people, was the only one she had, and changed it for tight pants, very similar to the ones Pietro Crespi wore in dance classes. And a silk shirt woven with the live worm, and with his initials embroidered on the heart. Twice a week he washed the complete change in the pool, and kept the tunic until it was dry, as he had nothing else to wear. He never ate in the house. He went out into the street when the heat of the siesta eased, and did not return until late at night. Then he continued his anguished wandering, breathing like a cat, and thinking of Amaranta. She, and the ghastly gaze of the saints in the glow of the night lamp, were the two memories he kept of the house. Many times, in the hallucinatory Roman August, he had opened his eyes in the middle of sleep, and he had seen Amaranta emerging from a brocatel marble pool, with her lace skirt and bandage in hand, idealized by the anxiety of exile. Unlike Orleano Jose, who tried to smother that image in the bloody swamp of war, he tried to keep it alive in a quagmire of lust, while entertaining his mother with the endless hoax of the pontifical vocation. Neither he nor Fernanda ever thought that their correspondence was an exchange of fantasies. José Arcadio, who left the seminary as soon as he arrived in Rome, continued to nurture the legend of theology and canon law, so as not to endanger the fabulous inheritance of which the delusional letters of his mother spoke to him, and which was to rescue him. Of the misery and squalor he shared with two friends in a garret in Trastevere. When he received the last letter from Fernanda, Dictated by a foreboding of imminent death, he packed the last scraps of his false splendor into a suitcase, and crossed the ocean into a hold where emigrants huddled like slaughterhouse cattle, eating cold macaroni and wormy cheese. Before reading Fernanda's will, which was no more than a meticulous and belated recapitulation of misfortunes, the dilapidated furniture and undergrowth of the corridor had already told her that she was in a trap from which she would never emerge forever exiled from the diamond light and the immemorial air of the Roman spring. In the exhausting insomnia of asthma, he measured and remeasured the depth of his misfortune, while he reviewed the dark house where Ursula's senile fuss infused him with fear of the world. To be sure not to lose him in the dark, she had assigned him a corner of the bedroom, the only one where he could be safe from the dead that had roamed the house since dusk. Whatever bad thing you do, Ursula told him the saints will tell me. The pale nights of his childhood were reduced to that corner, where he remained motionless until bedtime, sweating with fear on a stool, under the watchful and icy gaze of the holy accusers. It was useless torture, because by that time he was already terrified of everything around him, and he was prepared to be scared of everything he encountered in life, the women in the street, who spoiled the blood, the women of the house, who gave birth to pig-tailed children, fighting cocks, which caused the deaths of men and pangs of conscience for the rest of their lives, firearms, which just by touching them condemned to twenty years of war, the misguided undertakings, which only led to disappointment and madness, and everything, in short, 
everything that God had created with his infinite goodness, and that the devil had perverted. When he woke up, crushed by the nightmare lathe, the clarity of the window and the caresses of Amaranta in the pool, and the delight with which she dusted him between his legs with an acorn of silk, freed him from terror. Even Ursula was different under the radiant light of the garden, because there he did not speak to her about terrifying things, but rubbed her teeth with coal dust so that she would have the radiant smile of a pope, and cut and polished her nails to that the pilgrims who came to Rome from all over the world were amazed at the neatness of the pope's hands when he gave them the blessing, and he combed it like a pope, and soaked it with flowery water so that his body and clothes had the fragrance of a pope. In the courtyard of Castel Gondolfo he had seen the Pope on a balcony, delivering the same speech in seven languages to a crowd of pilgrims, and the only thing that had indeed caught his attention was the whiteness of his hands, which seemed macerated in bleach, the dazzling glow of her summer clothes, and her hidden breath of cologne. Almost a year after returning home, having sold the silver candle Abra and the heraldic pot that at the moment of truth only had gold inlays on the shield to eat. Jose Arcadio's only distraction was picking up children in town. For them to play in the house. He would show up with them at nap time, making them jump rope in the garden, sing in the hallway, and do ropes on the living room furniture, while he walked between the groups giving lessons in good behavior. By this time he had finished with the narrow trousers and silk shirt, and wore an ordinary change from Arab stores, but still maintained his languid dignity and papal manner. The children took over the house as Meme's companions did in the past. Until late at night they could be heard chattering and singing and dancing with their feet, so that the house seemed like a boarding school without discipline. Orleano did not worry about the invasion as long as they did not go to disturb him in Melchiada's room. One morning, two children pushed open the door, and they were shocked at the sight of the shaggy, hairy man still deciphering the scrolls on the work table. They did not dare to enter but they continue to prowl the room. They came whispering out of the cracks, they threw live animals through the skylights, and once they nailed the door and window on the outside, and Orleano needed half a day to force them. Amused by the impunity of their antics, four children entered the room another morning, while Orleano was in the kitchen, ready to destroy the scrolls. But as soon as they seized the yellowed sheets, an angelic force lifted them from the ground, and kept them suspended in the air, until Orleano returned and snatched the scrolls from them. Since then they have not bothered him again. The four older children, who wore shorts even though they were already in their teens, took care of Jose Arcadio's personal appearance. They arrived earlier than the others, and spent the morning shaving him, massaging him with hot towels, cutting and polishing his fingernails and toenails, perfuming him with flowery water. On several occasions they got into the pool, to soap him from head to toe, while he floated on his back, thinking of Amaranta. Then they dried him, powdered his body, and dressed him. One of the children, who had curly blonde hair and pink glass eyes like rabbits, used to sleep in the house. The ties that united him to Jose Arcadio were so strong, who accompanied him in his asthmatic insomnia, without speaking wandering with him through the house in darkness. One night they saw in the bedroom where Ursula slept a yellow glow through the crystallized concrete, as if an underground sun had turned the bedroom floor into stained glass. You don't have to turn on the spotlight. It was enough for them to lift the broken plates from the corner where Ursula's bed had always been, and where the glow was most intense, to find the secret crypt that Orleano Segundo got tired of searching in the delirium of the excavations. There were the three canvas sacks closed with copper wire and, inside them, the 7,214 doubloons of four, which continued to glow like embers in the dark. The discovery of the treasure was like an explosion. Instead of returning to Rome with untimely fortune, which was the dream matured in misery, Jose Arcadio turned the house into a decadent paradise. She changed the curtains and canopy in the bedroom to new velvet, and had them tile the bathroom floor and tile the walls. The dining room cupboard was filled with sugared fruits, hams, and pickles, and the disused barn reopened to store wines and spirits that Jose Arcadio himself removed at the railway station, in boxes marked with his name. One night he and the four older children threw a party that lasted until dawn. 
At six in the morning they came out of the bedroom naked, emptied the pool and filled it with champagne. They dove in a flock, swimming like flying birds in a golden sky of fragrant bubbles, while Jose Arcadio chartered face up, on the sidelines of the party, evoking Amaranta with white eyes. He remained thus, lost in thought, ruminating the bitterness of his equivocal pleasures, until after the children had grown weary and flocked to the bedroom, where they tore the velvet curtains to dry, and cracked the rock crystal moon in disorder, and they broke the canopy of the bed trying to lie down in a tumult. When Jose Arcadio returned from the bathroom, he found them sleeping huddled together, naked, in a shipwreck bedroom. Fired not so much by the ravages as by the disgust and pity he felt against himself in the desolate emptiness of Saturnalia, he armed himself with some disciplines of an ecclesiastical dog that he kept in the bottom of the trunk, joined with a hair shirt and other irons of mortification and penance, and expelled the children from the house, howling like a madman, and whipping them mercilessly, as he would not have done with a pack of coyotes. He was demolished, with an asthma attack that lasted for several days, giving him the appearance of a dying man. On the third night of torture, overcome by suffocation, he went to Orleano's room to ask him for the favor of buying him some powders to inhale from a nearby pharmacy. That was how Orleano made his second outing to the street. I only had to walk two blocks to get to the narrow drugstore with its dusty stained glass windows and faience handles marked in Latin, where a girl with the stealthy beauty of a Nile serpent dispensed him the medicine that Jose Arcadio had written for her on a piece of paper. The second sight of the deserted town, barely lit by the yellowish light bulbs in the streets, aroused no more curiosity in Orleano than the first time. Jose Arcadio had managed to think that he had fled, when he saw him appear again, a little anxious because of the haste, dragging his legs that the confinement and the lack of mobility had made weak and clumsy. His indifference to the world was so true that twelve few days later, Jose Arcadio violated the promise he had made to his mother, and released him to go out whenever he wanted. I have nothing to do in the street, Orleano replied. He remained locked up, absorbed in the scrolls that sin little bit little by little he was unraveling, and whose meaning, however, he could not interpret. Jose Arcadio brought him slices of H.A. to the fourth Monday, sugary flowers that left a spring aftertaste in the mouth, and occasionally a glass of good wine. He was not interested in scrolls, which he regarded more as esoteric entertainment, but was struck by the rare wisdom and inexplicable knowledge of the world held by this desolate relative. He knew then that he was capable of understanding written English and that between parchment and parchment he had read from the first page to the last, as if it were a novel, the six volumes of the encyclopedia. To this he attributed at first the fact that Orleano could speak of Rome as if he had lived there for many years, but very soon he realized that he had knowledge that was not encyclopedic, such as the prices of things. Everything is known, was the only answer he received from Orleano, when he asked how he had obtained that information. Orleano, for his part, was surprised that Jose Arcadio seen up close was so different from the image that had formed of him when he saw him wandering around the house. He was capable of laughing, of indulging from time to time a nostalgia for the home's past, and of worrying about the miserable environment in Melchiades's room. That approach between lonely people of the same blood was very far from friendship but it allowed them both to better cope with the unfathomable loneliness that at the same time separated and united them. Jose Arcadio was then able to go to Orleano to untangle certain domestic problems that exasperated him. Orleano, in turn, could sit down to read in the corridor, receive the letters from Amaranta Ursula that continued to arrive with the usual punctuality, and use the bathroom from where Jose Arcadio had exiled him since his arrival. One hot morning they both woke up alarmed by a pressing knock on the front door. He was a dark old man, with large green eyes that gave his face a spectral phosphorescence, and with an ash cross on his forehead. The tattered clothes, the torn shoes, the old rucksack that the man carried as his only luggage, gave him the appearance of a beggar, but his demeanor had a dignity that was in direct contradiction to his appearance. It was enough to see him once, even in the dim light of the room to realize that the secret force that allowed him to live was not the instinct of self-preservation, but the habit of fear. It was Orleano Amador, 
the only survivor of Colonel Orleano Buendia's 17 children, who was looking for a truce in his long and hazardous existence as a fugitive. He identified himself, begged that they give him refuge in that house that in his pariah nights he had evoked as the last stronghold of security he had left in his life. But José Arcadio and Orleano did not remember him. Believing him to be a homeless man, they shoved him out into the street. Both of them then saw from the door the end of a drama that had begun before José Arcadio had the use of reason. Police officers who had chased Orleano Amador for years, who had tracked him like dogs all over the world, emerged from among the almond trees on the opposite sidewalk and fired Mauser shots that penetrated him cleanly through the ash cross. In fact, since he expelled the children from the house, José Arcadio had been waiting for news of an ocean liner leaving for Naples before Christmas. He had told Orleano, and had even made plans to set up a business that would allow him to live, because the food basket did not arrive since Fernanda's funeral. However, that final dream was not to be fulfilled either. One morning in September, after having coffee with Orleano in the kitchen, José Arcadio was finishing his daily bath when the four children he had expelled from the house burst through the tile gates. Without giving him time to defend themselves, they climbed into the pool, clothed, grabbed him by the hair, and held his head down, until the bubbling of agony ceased on the surface, and the silent, pale dolphin body slid to the bottom. From the fragrant waters. Then they took three sacks of air that only they and their victim knew where they were hidden. It was such a swift, methodical, and brutal action that it seemed like a military assault. Orleano, locked in his room, didn't notice anything. That afternoon, having missed him in the kitchen, she looked around the house for José Arcadio, and found him freighting in the scented mirrors of the pool, huge and swollen, and still thinking about Amaranta. Only then did she realize how much she had begun to love him. Amaranta Ursula returned with the first angels of December, pushed by sailboat breezes, leading the husband tied by the neck with a silk cord. She appeared without any announcement, in an ivory-colored dress, a string of pearls that reached almost to the knees, emerald and topaz rings, and round and straight hair finished in the ears with the tips of swallows. The man she had married six months earlier was a mature, slender Flemish with the air of a navigator. She had only to push open the living room door to understand that his absence had been longer and more devastating than she had supposed. My God, she cried, more cheerful than alarmed, how can it be seen that there is not a woman in this house? The luggage did not fit in the corridor. In addition to Fernanda's old trunk with which she was sent to school, she carried vertical wardrobes, four large suitcases, a bag for umbrellas, eight boxes of hats, a gigantic cage with half a hundred canaries, and her husband's velocipede, unarmed inside. Of a special case that allowed to carry it like a cello. He did not even allow himself a day's rest after the long journey. She put on a worn canvas overalls that her husband had worn with other biker gear, and began a new restoration of the house. He dislodged the fire ants that had already taken over the corridor, resurrected the rose bushes, uprooted the weeds, and planted ferns, oregano and begonias again in the pots on the handrail. He led a crew of carpenters, locksmiths and bricklayers who repaired the cracks in the floors, fixed doors and windows, renovated the furniture and whitewashed the walls inside and out, so that three months after his arrival he breathed again the air of youth and party that existed in the days of the pianola. No one was ever seen in the house in a better mood at all times and under any circumstance nor was anyone more willing to sing and dance, and to throw away tempered things and customs. With a sweep of the broom, he wiped out the funerary memories and the piles of useless jerumbex and superstition devices that clustered in the corners, and the only thing he kept, out of gratitude to Ursula, was the daguerreotype of Remedios in the room. Look what a luxury, she cried out with laughter. A fourteen-year-old great-grandmother. When one of the bricklayers told her that the house was full of ghosts, and that the only way to scare them away was by looking for the treasures they had left buried, she replied with a laugh that she did not believe in men's superstitions. She was so spontaneous, so emancipated, with such a modern and free spirit, that Orleano didn't know what to do with his body when he saw her arrive. What a barbarian! 
She yelled happily, with open arms. Look how my beloved cannibal has grown. Before he had time to react, she had already put a record on the portable gramophone that he brought with him, and was trying to teach him the fashionable dances. She forced him to change out of the skinny pants that he inherited from Colonel Orleano Buendia, gave him youth shirts and colorless shoes, and pushed him out into the street when he spent a lot of time in Melchiades's room. Active, petite, indomitable, like Ursula, and almost as beautiful and provocative as Remedies, the beauty, she was endowed with a rare instinct to anticipate fashion. When he received the most recent figurines by mail, they hardly served him to verify that he had not made a mistake in the models he invented, and that he was sewing on Amaranta's rudimentary crank machine. She subscribed to every fashion magazine, artistic information, and popular music that was published in Europe, and she barely glanced at them to realize that things were going in the world as she imagined them. It was not understandable that a woman with that spirit would have returned to a dead town, depressed by the dust and heat and even less with a husband who had enough money to live well anywhere in the world, and who loved her so much that he he had submitted to be carried and brought by her with the silk noose. However, as time passed, his intention to stay became more evident, since he did not conceive plans that were not they were in the long term, nor did he make decisions that were not aimed at ensuring a comfortable life and a quiet old age in Macondo. The canary cage showed that these purposes were not improvised. Remembering that her mother had told her about the extermination of the birds in a letter, she had delayed the trip for several months until she found a ship that would stop at the Fortunate Islands, and there she selected the 25 pairs of finest canaries to repopulate the Macondo sky. That was the most regrettable of his many frustrated initiatives. As the birds reproduced, Amaranta Ursula released them in pairs, and it took them longer to feel free than to flee the town. In vain he tried to enchant them with the aviary that Ursula built in the first restoration. In vain he falsified esparto nests for them in the almond trees, and he sprinkled birdseed on the roofs and stirred up the captives so that his songs would dissuade the deserters, because they went back to the first attempt and gave a return in the sky, just the time essential to find your way back to the fortunate islands. A year after the return, although she had not managed to establish a friendship or promote a party, Amaranta Ursula continued to believe that it was possible to rescue that community chosen by misfortune. Gaston, her husband, was careful not to oppose her, although from the deadly noon when he got off the train he understood that his wife's determination had been caused by a mirage of nostalgia. Certain that she would be defeated by reality, she did not even bother to assemble the velocipede, but instead began to chase the most lucid eggs among the cobwebs that the masons shed and she opened them with her nails and spent hours contemplating with a magnifying glass the tiny spiders that came out of the interior. Later, believing that Amaranta Ursula was continuing with the reforms for not giving her arm to twist, she resolved to assemble the spectacular velocipede whose front wheel was much larger than the rear one, and she dedicated herself to capturing and dissecting whatever aboriginal insects she found in the contours that he referred in jars of jam to his former professor of natural hysteria at the University of Leech, where he had done advanced studies in entomology although his dominant vocation was that of aeronaut. When he was riding the velocipede he wore acrobat pants, bagpipe stockings and a detective's hat, but when he was walking he was dressed in raw linen, faultless, with white shoes, a silk bow tie, a boater hat and a wicker rod in hand. He had pale pupils that accentuated his sailor's air, and a little squirrel-haired mustache. Although he was at least fifteen years older than his wife, his youthful tastes, his vigilant determination to make her happy, and his virtues as a good lover made up the difference. In reality, those who saw that forty-year-old with cautious habits, with his fishing line around his neck and his circus bicycle, would not have asked to think that he had a pact of unbridled love with his young wife and that both yielded to reciprocal pressure in the least suitable places. And where inspiration surprised them, as they did since they began to see each other, and with a passion that the passage of time and increasingly unusual circumstances deepened and enriched. Gaston was not only a fierce lover, of inexhaustible wisdom and imagination, but he was perhaps the first man in the history of the species who made an emergency landing and was about to kill himself with his girlfriend just for making love. 
in a field of violets. They had met three years before they were married, when the sports biplane in which he was pirouetting over the school where Amaranta Ursula was studying attempted an intrepid maneuver to avoid the flagpole, and the primitive canvas and aluminum foil frame was left hanging by the glue on the electrical power cables. Since then, ignoring her splinted leg, he would go on weekends to pick up Amaranta Ursula at the nun's boarding house where she always lived, whose regulations were not as severe as Fernanda wished, and he would take her to his sports club. They began to love each other 500 meters above sea level, in the Sunday air of the moors, and the more they felt intimated the more tiny the beings on earth became. She spoke to him of Macondo as the most luminous and placid town in the world, and of a huge house, scented with oregano, where she wanted to live until old age with a loyal husband and two untamed children named Rodrigo and Gonzalo, and in no case Orleano and Jose Arcadio, and a daughter named Virginia, and in no case Remedios. She had evoked with such longing tenacity the town idealized by nostalgia that Gaston understood that she would not want to marry if he did not take her to live in Macondo. He agreed, as he did later with the line, because he believed that it was a temporary whim that was better to disappoint in time. But when years passed in Macondo and Amaranta Ursula was still as happy as the first day, he began to give alarm signals. By then he had dissected all the insects that were dissectable in the region, spoke Spanish like a native, and had deciphered all the crosswords in the magazines they received by mail. He did not have the pretext of the weather to hasten the return, because nature had endowed him with a colonial liver, which resisted without damage the heat of the siesta and the water with worms. He liked Creole food so much that he once ate a pan of 80 iguana eggs. Amaranta Ursula, on the other hand toward toward bring on the train fish and shellfish in ice boxes, meats in cans and syrupy fruits, which was all he could eat, and he continued to dress in European fashion and receive figurines in the mail, even though he had nowhere to go or to who to visit and that at this point her husband lacked the humor to appreciate her short dresses, her lopsided felts, and her seven-strand necklaces. Her secret seemed to consist in the fact that she always found a way to be busy, solving domestic problems that she herself created and doing certain things wrong that she corrected the next day, with a pernicious diligence that would have made Fernanda think about the hereditary vice of doing to undo. His festive genius was still so awake at that time that when he received new records he invited Gaston to stay in the room until very late to rehearse the dances that his schoolmates described to him with drawings, and they generally ended up making love in the Viennese rocking chairs or in the bare ground. The only thing she needed to be completely happy was the birth of her children, but she respected the pact she had made with her husband not to have them before they were married for five years. Looking for something to fill his dead hours, Gaston used to spend the morning in Melchiades's room, with the elusive Orleano. He took pleasure in evoking with him the most intimate corners of his land, which Orleano knew as if he had been there for a long time. When Gaston asked him how he had managed to obtain information that was not in the encyclopedia, he received the same response as José Arcadio. Everything is known. In addition to Sanskrit, Orleano had learned English and French, and some Latin and Greek. Since then he went out every afternoon, and Amaranta Ursula had assigned him a weekly sum for his personal expenses, his room seemed like a section of the Catalan Scholar's bookstore. He read avidly until late at night, although from the way he referred to his reading, Gaston thought that he did not buy the books to inform himself but to verify the accuracy of his knowledge, and that none interested him more than the scrolls, to which he dedicated the best hours of the morning. Both Gaston and his wife would have liked to incorporate him into family life, but Orleano was a hermetic man, with a cloud of mystery that time was thickening. It was such an insurmountable condition that Gaston failed in his efforts to become intimate with him, and had to find other entertainment to fill his dead hours. It was around this time that he conceived the idea of establishing an airmail service. It was not a new project. In fact, he was quite advanced when he met Amaranta Ursula, only it was not for Macondo sign for the Belgian Congo, where his family had investments in palm oil. The marriage, the decision to spend a few months in Macondo to please his wife, had forced him to put her off. But when he saw that Amaranta Ursula was determined to organize a public improvement meeting, 
and even laughed at him for hinting at the possibility of returning, he understood that things were going for a long time, and he returned to establish contact with his forgotten partners in Brussels, thinking that in order to be a pioneer, the Caribbean was the same as Africa. While the negotiations progressed, he prepared a landing camp in the old enchanted region that then seemed a plain of cracked flint, and studied the direction of the winds, the geography of the coastline and the most suitable routes for air navigation, without knowing that it's the diligence, so much like Mr. Herbert's, was instilling in the people the dangerous suspicion that its purpose was not to plan itineraries but to plant bananas. Excited about an occurrence that after all could justify his definitive establishment in Macondo, he made several trips to the provincial capital, met with the authorities, and obtained licenses and signed exclusive contracts. Meanwhile, he was maintaining a correspondence similar to that of Fernando with the invisible doctors with the Brussels partners, and he ended up convincing them to embark the first airplane under the care of an expert mechanic, who would assemble it at the nearest port and take it over. To Macondo. A year after the first meteorological measurements and calculations, trusting in the repeated promises of his correspondence, he had acquired the habit of walking through the streets, looking at the sky, listening to the rumors of the breeze, waiting for the airplane to appear. Although she had not noticed it, the return of Amaranta Ursula determined a radical change in Aureliano's life. After the death of José Arcadio, he had become a regular customer of the Catalan Scholar's Bookstore. In addition, the freedom that he enjoyed then, and the time he had, aroused a certain curiosity about the town, which he met without astonishment. He walked the lonely, dusty streets, examining with scientific rather than human interest the interior of the ruined houses, the metal grids of the windows, broken by rust and dying birds, and the inhabitants beaten by memories. In his imagination he tried to reconstruct the ravaged splendor of the old banana company town, whose dry pool was filled to the brim with rotten men's shoes and women's slippers, and in whose weed-torn houses he found the skeleton of a dog. German still tied to a ring with a steel chain, and a telephone that rang, 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 until he picked it up, he understood that an anguished and remote woman was asking in English, and he answered that yes, that the strike had finished, that the three thousand dead had been thrown into the sea, that the banana company had left, and that Macondo had finally been at peace for many years. Those forays took him to the prostrate neighborhood of Tolerance, where in other times bundles of bills were burned to animate the Cumbiamba, and which then was a twist of streets more afflicted and miserable than the others, with some red lights still on, and with wastelands. Ballrooms adorned with garlands, where the gaunt and fat widows of no one, the French great-grandmothers and the Babylonian matriarchs, continued to wait next to the Victrolas. Orleano could not find anyone who remembered his family, not even Colonel Orleano Buendia, except for the oldest of the Antillean Negroes, an old man whose cotton head made him look like a photographic negative, who continued to sing on the porch of the house. Gloomy Psalms of the Evening Orleano talked with him in the convoluted papiamento that he learned in a few weeks, and sometimes he shared the broth of rooster heads that his great-granddaughter prepared, a large black woman with solid bones, mare's hips and teats of live melons, and a round head, perfect, armored by a hard headpiece of wire hair, which looked like the coif of a medieval warrior. It was called necromanta. At that time, Orleano made a living by selling cutlery, candlesticks and other household cheeses. When he was penniless, which was the most common, he would get the rooster heads that they were going to throw away in the garbage at the inns of the market, and he would take them to Negromanta to make his soups augmented with purslin and scented. With peppermint. When the great-grandfather died, Orleano stopped going to the house, but he found Negromanta going down the dark almond trees of the square, captivating the few night owls with his Montuno animal whistles. Many times he accompanied her speaking in papiamento of rooster head soups and other delicacies of misery, and would have continued to do so if she had not made him realize that his company was driving him away from his clientele. Though he was tempted at times, and though Necromanta herself would have found it a natural culmination of shared nostalgia, he did not sleep with her. So Orleano was still a virgin when Amaranta Ursula returned to Macondo and gave him a brotherly hug that took his breath away. Every time I saw her, 
and were still still when she taught him the fashionable dances, he felt the same helplessness of sponges in his bones that disturbed his great-great-grandfather when Pilar Turner a pretext him for playing cards in the barn. Trying to quell the torment, he plunged deeper into the scrolls and eluded the innocent flattery of that aunt who poisoned his nights with effluvia of tribulation, but the more he avoided her, the more anxiously he awaited her stony laugh, her happy cat howls. And his songs of gratitude, dying of love at any time and in the least expected places of the house. One night, ten meters from her bed, on the silver counter, the thick bodies of her unhinged belly smashed the window and ended up loving each other in a puddle of muriatic acid. Orleano not only could not sleep a minute, but he spent the next day with a fever, sobbing with rage. The arrival of the first night in which he waited for Nigromanta in the shade of the almond trees, crossed by the ice needles of uncertainty, and clenching in his fist the weight with fifty cents that he had asked Amaranta Ursula, seemed eternal to him, not so much because she needed them, as to complicate her, debase and prostitute her in some way with her adventure. Nigromanta took him to his room lit by trick candles, to his scissor bed with the canvas damaged by bad loves, and his body of a brave, inveterate, heartless bitch, who prepared to dispatch as if he were a frightened child, and he suddenly found himself with a man whose tremendous power he demanded of his you have a seismic rearrangement movement. They became lovers. Orleano spent the morning deciphering scrolls, and at nap time he would go to the soporific bedroom where Necromanta was waiting for him to teach him to do first like worms, then eat snails and finally like crabs, until he had to leave it to stock loves missing. Several weeks passed before Orleano discovered that she had a headband around her waist that seemed to be made from a cello string, but was hard as steel and lacked a finial, because she had been born and raised with it. Almost always, between love and love, they ate naked in bed, in the hallucinatory heat and the daytime stars that the rust was making appear on the zinc ceiling go down. It was the first time that Nigromanta had a fixed man, a bruising man, as she herself said dead with laughter, and she was even beginning to have illusions of heart when Orleano confided in her his repressed passion for Amaranta Ursula, which he had not been able to remedy with the substitution but his insides twisted more and more as the experience broadened the horizon of love. Then Nigromanta continued to receive him with the same warmth as always, but he made himself pay for the services with such rigor that when Orleano had no money he charged them to the account that he did not carry with sign numbers with lines that he traced with his thumbnail behind of the door. At dusk, while she was winding down in the shadows of the square, Orleano passed through the corridor like a stranger, barely greeting Amaranta Ursula and Gaston who usually dined at that time, and would shut himself up in the room again, unable to read. Not writing, not even thinking, from the anxiety provoked by the laughter, the whispers, the preliminary romps, and then the explosions of agonizing happiness that filled the nights at home. That was his life two years before Gaston started waiting for the airplane and it was still the same the afternoon when he went to the Catalan Scholar's bookstore and found four ranting boys, fierce in a discussion about the methods of killing cockroaches in the city. Middle Ages The old bookseller, knowing Aureliano's fondness for books that only Bede the Venerable had read, urged him with a certain paternal malignancy to intervene in the controversy, and he did not even take a breath to explain that cockroaches, the oldest winged insect on earth, he was already the favorite victim of flip-flops in the Old Testament, but as a species he was definitely refractory to any method of extermination, from tomato slices with borax to flour with sugar, since his 1,600 varieties had resisted the most remote, tenacious and ruthless persecution that man had unleashed from its origins against any living being, including man himself, to the extent that just as a reproductive instinct was attributed to the human race, a more defined instinct should be attributed to it and compelling, that it was the instinct to kill cockroaches, and that if they had managed to escape human ferocity it was because they had refuted turned into darkness. Where they were made invulnerable by man's congenital fear of the dark, but instead became susceptible to the noonday splendor, so that as early as the Middle Ages, today and forever and ever, the only effective method of killing cockroaches was solar glare. That encyclopedic fatalism was the beginning of a great friendship. Orleano continued to meet every afternoon with the four debaters, 
whose names were Alvaro, German, Alfonso, and Gabriel, the first and last friends he had in life. For a man like him, encased in written reality, those stormy sessions that began in the bookstore at six in the afternoon and ended in the brothels at dawn were a revelation. It had not occurred to him until then that literature was the best toy that had been invented to make fun of people, as Alvaro demonstrated on a night out. Some time had to pass before Orleano realized that he had so much arbitrariness erect in the example of the Catalan wise man, for whom wisdom was not worthwhile if it was not possible to use it to invent a new way of preparing chickpeas. The afternoon in which Orleano sat lecture on cockroaches, the discussion ended at the house of the girls who went to bed from hunger, a brothel of lies on the outskirts of Macondo. The owner was a smiling Mama Santa, tormented by the mania of opening and closing doors. His eternal smile seemed caused by the credulity of the customers, who admitted as something true an establishment that did not exist except in the imagination, because there even tangible things were unreal, the furniture that fell apart when you sat down, the gutted Victrola inside which there was a hen hatching, the garden of paper flowers, the almanacs from years before the arrival of the banana company the pictures with lithographs cut out of magazines that were never published. Even the shy little horse who came from the neighborhood when the owner told them that customers had arrived, were a pure invention. They appeared without saying hello, with the little flowered dresses of when they were five years younger, and they took them off with the same innocence with which they had been put on, and in the paroxysm of love they exclaimed in amazement what atrocity, look how that ceiling is falling and as soon as they received their peso with fifty cents they spent it on bread and a piece of cheese that the owner sold them, more smiling than ever, because only she knew that this food was not true. Either. Orleano, whose world at that time began in the parchments of Melchiades and ended in the bed of Nigromanta, found in the imaginary brothel a donkey cure for shyness. At first he could not get anywhere in rooms where the owner entered the best moments of love and made all kinds of comments about the intimate charms of the protagonists. But over time he became so familiar with those mishaps of the world that one night more unhinged than the others he undressed in the living room and walked around the house balancing a bottle of beer on his unthinkable masculinity. It was he who made the extravagances that the owner celebrated with her eternal smile, without protesting, without believing in them the same when German tried to set fire to the house to show that it did not exist, as when Alfonso twisted the parrot's neck and he poured it into the pot where the chicken stew was beginning to boil. Although Orleano felt linked to the four friends by the same affection and solidarity, to the point that he thought of them as one, he was closer to Gabriel than to the others. The bond was born the night he casually spoke of Colonel Orleano Buendia, and Gabriel was the only one who did not believe he was making fun of someone. Even the owner, who did not usually intervene in the conversations, argued with the rabid passion of a midwife that Colonel Orleano Buendia, of whom in fact she had once heard, was a character invented by the government as a pretext to kill liberals. Gabriel, on the other hand, did not question the reality of Colonel Orleano Buendia, because he had been a companion in arms and inseparable friend of his great-grandfather, Colonel Gerinaldo Marquez. Those vagaries of memory were even more critical when talking about the massacre of the workers. Every time Orleano touched the point, not only the owner, but some people older than her, repudiated the hoax of the workers cornered in the station, and the train of two hundred wagons loaded with dead, and even persisted in what after everything had been established in court records and in elementary school texts, that the banana company had never existed. So Orleano and Gabriel were linked by a kind of complicity, founded on real events in which no one believed, and which had affected their lives to the point that they were both adrift in the hangover of a finished world, of the which only nostalgia remained. Gabriel slept where the hour caught him. Orleano accommodated him several times in the silver workshop, but he spent his nights awake, disturbed by the traffic of the dead who walked through the bedrooms until dawn. Later he entrusted it to Negromanta, who took him to his crowded little room when he was free, and he wrote down the accounts with vertical lines behind the door, in the few available spaces that Aureliano's debts had left. Despite his messy life, the whole group was trying to do something lasting, at the urging of the wise Catalan. It was he, with his experience as a former professor of classical letters and his deposit of rare books, 
who had put them in a position to spend a whole night looking for the 37th dramatic situation, in a town where no one had any interest or possibilities to go further. Past Elementary School Fascinated by the discovery of friendship, stunned by the spells of a world that had been forbidden to him by Fernanda's pettiness, Orleano abandoned scrutiny of the scrolls, precisely when they began to reveal themselves to him as predictions in coded verses. But the later verification that time was enough for everything without it being necessary to give up the brothels, encouraged him to return to Melchiada's room, determined not to waver in his efforts until he discovered the last clues. That was for the days when Gaston began to wait for the airplane, and Amaranta Ursula was so alone that one morning she appeared in the room. Hello, cannibal, he said. Again in the cave. She was irresistible, with her made-up dress, and one of the long necklaces of shad vertebrae, which she made herself. She had given up the line, convinced of her husband's fidelity, and for the first time since her return she seemed to have some leisure time. Orleano would not have needed to see her to know that she had arrived. She leaned on the work table, so close and helpless that Orleano heard the deep sound of her bones, and became interested in the scrolls. Trying to get over his embarrassment, he caught the voice that was leaking from him, the life that was leaving him, the memory that was turning into a petrified polyp, and spoke to him of the Levitical destiny of the Sanskrit, of the scientific possibility of seeing the future transparent in time as seen against the light what is written on the reverse of a paper, the need to encrypt the predictions so that they do not defeat themselves, and the centuries of Nostradamus and the destruction of Cantabria announced by St. Millen. Suddenly, without interrupting the conversation, Moved by an impulse that had been sleeping in him since its origins, Orleano put his hand on hers, believing that this final decision put an end to the anxiety. Yet she took his index finger with the loving innocence with which she did so many times in childhood, and held it while he continued to answer her questions. They stayed that way, linked by an icy index that didn't convey anything in any way, until she woke up from her momentary sleep and slapped her forehead. The ants. He exclaimed. And then she forgot the manuscripts, she came to the door with a dance step, and from there she sent Orleano with the tips of her fingers the same kiss with which she said goodbye to her father the afternoon they sent her to Brussels. You explain to me later, he said. I had forgotten that today is the day to put lime in the holes of the ants. She kept going to the room occasionally, when she had something to do around these parts, and stayed there for a few minutes while her husband continued to scan the sky. Excited with that change, Orleano then stayed to eat as a family, as he had not done since the first months of Amaranta Ursula's return. Gaston liked it. In after-dinner conversations, which often lasted for more than an hour, he pained that his partners were cheating on him. They had announced the boarding of the airplane on a ship that did not arrive, and although his shipping agents insisted that it would never arrive because it was not on the lists of Caribbean ships, his partners insisted that the dispatch was correct, and even they hinted at the possibility of Gaston lying to them in his letters. The correspondence reached such a degree of reciprocal suspicion that Gaston chose not to write again, and began to suggest the possibility of a quick trip to Brussels, to clear things up, and return with the airplane. However, the project faded as soon as Amaranta Ursula reiterated her decision not to move from Macondo even if she was left without a husband. In the early days, Orleano shared the general idea that Gaston was a fool on a velocipede, and this elicited a vague feeling of pity. Later, when he obtained deeper information about the nature of men in the brothels, he thought that Gaston's meekness had its origin in unbridled passion. But when she got to know him better, and realized that his true character was at odds with his submissive behavior, she conceived the malicious suspicion that even waiting for the airplane was a sham. Then he thought that Gaston was not as stupid as he appeared, but on the contrary, a man of infinite constancy, ability, and patience, who had proposed to defeat his wife out of the fatigue of eternal complacency, of never saying no to her, of simulating an unlimited conformity, letting her get tangled in her own web, until the day when she could no longer bear the boredom of the illusions at hand, and she herself would pack her bags to return to Europe. The old piety of Orleano was transformed into a virulent animosity. 
Gaston's system seemed so perverse to him, but at the same time so effective, that he dared to warn Amaranta Ursula. Yet she scoffed at his suspicion, not even glimpsing the heartbreaking burden of love, uncertainty, and jealousy within him. It had not occurred to him that he aroused more than brotherly affection in Orleano, until he pricked his finger while trying to open a can of peaches, and he rushed to suck his blood with a hunger and devotion that made his skin crawl. Orleano. She laughed uneasily. You are too malicious to be a good bat. Then Orleano overflowed. Giving him orphan kisses in the bowl of his wounded hand. He opened the most hidden passages of his heart, and took out an endless and macerated gut, the terrible parasitic animal that had hatched in martyrdom. He told her how he got up at midnight to cry of helplessness and anger in the intimate clothes that she left drying in the bathroom. He told him how anxiously he asked Necromanta to screech like a cat, and how Gaston 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 sobbed in his ear, and how cunningly he plundered his perfume bottles to find them on the necks of the girls who went to bed from hunger. Shocked with the passion of that relief, Amaranta Ursula closed her fingers, contracting them like a mollusk, until her wounded hand, freed from all pain and all vestige of mercy, became a knot of emeralds and topaz, and stony bones and insensitive. Stupid. He said, as if he were spitting. I am going to Belgium in the first boat that leaves. Alvaro had arrived one of those afternoons at the library of the Catalan wise man, loudly proclaiming his latest find, a zoological brothel. It was called El Nino de Oro, and it was an immense open-air room where no less than two hundred curlews wandered at will, striking the time with a deafening cackle. In the wire pens that surrounded the dance floor, and among large Amazonian camellias, were colored herons, alligators fattened like pigs, twelve-bellied snakes, and a golden shell tortoise diving into a tiny man-made ocean. There was a white dog, meek and pedophile, who nevertheless served as a pimp so that they would feed him. The air had a naive density, as if it had just been invented, and the beautiful mulatto women who waited hopelessly among bloody petals and old-fashioned records, new traits of love that man had left forgotten in earthly paradise. The first night that the group visited that greenhouse of illusions, the splendid and taciturn old woman who guarded the entrance into a rocking liana, felt that time was returning to its primary springs, when among the five who arrived she discovered a bony, sallow man, with tartar cheekbones, marked forever and from the beginning of the world by the smallpox of loneliness. Oh, he sighed, Orleano. He was seeing Colonel Orleano Buendia again, as he saw him in the light of a lamp long before the wars, long before the desolation of glory and the exile of disenchantment, the remote dawn when he went to his bedroom to teach the first order of his life, the order to be given love. It was Pilar Turnera. Years before, when he was 145, he had renounced the pernicious habit of keeping track of his age, and continued to live in the static and marginal time of memories in a perfectly revealed and established future, beyond the futures disturbed by the lurks and insidious assumptions of the decks. Since that night, Orleano had taken refuge in the tenderness and compassionate understanding of the ignored great-great-grandmother. Sitting in the Liana rocking chair, she evoked the past, reconstructed the greatness and misfortune of the family and the devastated splendor of Macondo, while Alvaro scared the alligators with his uproarious laughter and Alfonso invented the gruesome story of the curlews that they pecked the eyes of four clients who had misbehaved the week before, and Gabriel was in the room of the pensive mulatto who did not collect love with money, but with letters for a smuggler boyfriend who was imprisoned on the other side of the Orinoco because the border guards had purged him and then set him in a potty that was filled with shit with diamonds. That true brothel, with that maternal mistress, was the world Orleano had dreamed of in his prolonged captivity. He felt so good, so close to the perfect accompaniment, that he did not think of another refuge the afternoon in which Amaranta Ursula crumbled his illusions. He was willing to unburden himself with words, to have someone undo the knots that were oppressing his chest, but he only managed to release himself into a fluid, warm and restorative cry, on Pilar Turner's lap. She let him finish, scratching his head with her fingertips and without him having revealed that he was crying with love she immediately recognized the oldest cry in the history of man. Well, little boy, she consoled him, 
now tell me who it is. When Orleano told her, Pilar Turnera gave a deep laugh, the old expansive laugh that had ended up looking like a pigeon squash. There was no mystery in the heart of a Buendia that was impenetrable for her, because a century of playing cards and experience had taught her that the history of the family was a cog of irreparable repetitions, a rotating wheel that had continued to turn until the end. Eternity, had it not been for the progressive and irremediable wear of the shaft. Don't worry, he smiled, wherever she is right now, she's waiting for you. It was 4.30 in the afternoon when Amaranta Ursula came out of the bathroom. Orleano saw her pass in front of his room, wearing a lightly pleated robe and a towel wrapped around her head like a turban. He followed her almost on tiptoe, reeling from drunkenness, and entered the bridal bedroom just as she opened her robe and closed it again in shock. He made a silent signal to the adjoining room, the door of which was ajar, and where Orleano I knew I knew that Gaston was beginning to write a letter. Go away, he said without a voice. Orleano smiled, lifted her by the waist with his bare hands, like a pot of begonias, and threw her face up on the bed. With a brutal jerk, he stripped her of her bathrobe before she had time to prevent it, and peered into the abyss of freshly washed nudity that had not a hint of skin, not a streak of hair, not a hidden mole that he would not have imagined. In the darkness of other rooms, Amaranta Ursula sincerely defended herself, with the cunning of a wise female, weaseling the elusive and flexible and fragrant body of a weasel, while she tried to unpin his kidneys with her knees and snarl his face with her nails, but without him or she emitting a sigh. That it could not be confused with the breathing of someone looking at the slow April twilight through the open window. It was a fierce fight, a battle to the death, which, however, seemed devoid of all violence because it was made up of distorted aggressions and spectral evasive, slow, cautious, solemn, so that between one and another there was time for them to return to the petunias would bloom and Gaston would forget his balloonist dreams in the next room, as if they were enemy lovers trying to reconcile at the bottom of a diaphanous pond. In the heat of the fierce and ceremonious struggle, Amaranta Ursula understood that the meticulousness of their silence was so irrational that it could have aroused the suspicions of the next husband much more than the din of war they were trying to avoid. Then he began to laugh with tight lips, without giving up the fight, but defending himself with false bites and gradually deconstructing his body, until both were aware of being adversaries and accomplices at the same time, and the fight degenerated into a conventional frolic. And the aggressions became caresses. Suddenly, almost playing, like one more mischief, Amaranta Ursula neglected her defense, and when she tried to react, scared of what she herself had made possible, it was too late. An enormous shock immobilized her in her center of gravity, planted her in her place, and her defensive will was demolished by the irresistible anxiety to discover what were the orange whistles and the invisible globes that awaited her on the other side of death. I barely had time to reach out and blindly look for the towel, and put a gag between her teeth so that the cat cries that were already tearing her insides would not come out. Pilar Turner died in the Liana rocking chair, one night of partying, guarding the entrance to her paradise. In accordance with her last will, she was buried without a coffin, sitting on the rocking chair that eight men lowered with ropes into a huge hole, dug in the center of the dance floor. The mulatto women dressed in black, pale from crying, improvised dark services while they took off their earrings, brooches, and rings, and they were throwing them in the grave, before they sealed it with a tombstone without name or dates and placed on it a promontory of Amazonian camellias. After poisoning the animals, they closed doors and windows with bricks and mortar, and scattered around the world with their wooden trunks, upholstered on the inside with pictures of saints, magazine stickers, and ephemeral, remote and fantastic portraits of bride and groom which they shit diamonds, or they ate cannibals, or they were crowned kings of decks at sea. It was the end. In the tomb of Pilar Turnera, among psalms and trinkets of whores, the rubble of the past was rotting, the few that remained after the Catalan wise man finished off the bookstore and returned to the Mediterranean village where he had been born, defeated by the nostalgia of a tenacious spring. No one could have foreseen his decision. He had arrived in Macondo in the splendor of the Banana Company, fleeing from one of so many wars, 
and he had not thought of anything more practical than to install that library of incunabula and original editions in several languages, which casual customers were suspicious of, as if they were garbage books, while they waited for their turn to have their dreams interpreted in the house across the street. He spent half his life in the hot back room, scribbling his precious writing in purple ink and on sheets that he tore from school notebooks, without anyone knowing for sure what he was writing. When Orleano met him, he had two drawers full of those variegated pages that somehow made one think of Melchiades' scrolls, and from then until when he left he had filled a third, so it was reasonable to think that he had not done anything else during his stay. In Macondo. The only people he related to were the four friends, who he exchanged spinning tops and kites for books, and had them read Seneca and Ovid while they were still in elementary school. He treated the classics with a homely familiarity, as if they had all been his roommates at one time, and he knew many things that simply were not to be known, such as that St. Augustine wore a woolen doublet under his habit that he did not remove in fourteen years old, and that Arnaldo de Villanova, the necromancer, became impotent since he was a child due to a scorpion bite. Her fervor for the written word was a warp of solemn respect and midwife irreverence. Not even his own manuscripts were safe from that duality. Having learned Catalan to translate them, Alfonso put a roll of pages in his pockets, which he always had full of newspaper clippings and manuals for strange trades, and one night he lost them in the house of the girls who went to bed from hunger. When the wise grandfather found out, Instead of making the dreaded scandal he commented with a laugh that this was the natural destiny of literature. Instead, there was no human power able to persuade him not to take the three crates when he returned to his native village, and he lashed out in Carthaginian expletives against the railroad inspectors who tried to send them as cargo, until he managed to stay with them in the passenger car. The world will have finished fucking itself, he said then, the day when men travel first class in literature in the freight car. That was the last he was heard to say. He had spent a black week with the final preparations for the trip, because as he approved as the hour went by, his humor was decomposing, and his intentions were misplaced, and the things he put in one place appeared in another, besieged by the same goblins who tormented him they talked about Fernanda. Collins, he cursed. I shit on Canon 27 of the London Synod. German and Orleano took care of him. They helped him like a child, they pinned his tickets and immigration documents in his pockets with nurse pins, they made him a detailed list of what he had to do from the time he left Macondo until he landed in Barcelona, but anyway he started inadvertently trash a pair of pants with half your money. On the eve of the trip, after nailing the drawers and putting the clothes in the same suitcase with which he had arrived, he wrinkled his clam lids, pointed with a kind of lewd blessing to the piles of books with which he had endured the exile, and said to your friends. There I leave that shit. Three months later, twenty-nine letters and more than fifty portraits were received in a large envelope, which had accumulated in the leisure of the high seas. Although he did not put dates, the order in which he had written the letters was evident. In the former, the adventures of the voyage had his usual humor, the desire that gave him to throw overboard the purser who did not allow him to put the three drawers in the cabin, the lucid imbecility of a lady who was terrified of the number 13, not out of superstition but because it seemed like a number that had remained unfinished, and the bet that he won at the first dinner because he recognized in the water on board the taste of nocturnal beats from the springs of Lida. As the days went by, however, the reality on board mattered less and less, and even the most recent and trivial events seemed worthy of longing, because as the ship moved away, his memory became sad. That process of nostalgia progressive was also evident in the portraits. At first he seemed happy, in his invalid shirt and snowy lock, in the sparkling October of the Caribbean. In the latter he was seen in a dark coat and silk scarf, pale in himself and morose from absence on the deck of a ship of grief that was beginning to sleep walking through autumnal oceans. German and Orleano answered his letters. He wrote so many in the first few months that they felt closer to him then than when he was in Macondo, and were almost relieved of the anger that he had left. At first he sent word that everything was still the same, that the pink snail was still in the house where it was born, that the dried herring had the same flavor in the bread tinder, 
that the village waterfalls continued to perfume themselves at sunset. They were again the notebook sheets reserved with little purple ticks, in which he dedicated a special paragraph to each one. However, and although he himself did not seem to notice it, those letters of recovery and encouragement were gradually transformed into pastorals of disappointment. On winter nights, while he was boiling the soup in the fireplace, he longed for the warmth of his back room, the buzz of the sun in the dusty almond trees, the train whistle in the slumber of a siesta, just as he longed for soup in Macondo. Winter in the fireplace, the cries of the coffee vendor and the fleeting larks of spring. Stunned by two nostalgies facing each other like two mirrors, he lost his wonderful sense of unreality, until he ended up recommending everyone to leave Macondo, to forget how much he had taught them about the world and the human heart, that they will shit on Horatio, and that wherever they were they would always remember that the past was a lie, that memory had no way back, that all ancient springtime was irretrievable, and that the most foolish and tenacious love was nevertheless an ephemeral truth. Alvaro was the first to heed the advice to abandon Macondo. He sold everything, even the captive tiger who taunted passers-by in his backyard, and bought eternal passage on a train that had never finished traveling. In the postcards he sent from the intermediate stations, he shouted at the instant images he had seen through the car window, and it was like tearing up and throwing into oblivion the long poem of transience, the chimerical blacks in the cotton fields of Louisiana the winged horses in the blue grass of Kentucky, the Greek lovers in the hellish twilight of Arizona, the girl in a red sweater who painted watercolors on the lakes of Michigan, and who with her brushes gave him a goodbye that was not from goodbye but of hope, because he did not know that he was seeing a train go by without return. Then Alfonso and German left, one Saturday, with the idea of returning on Monday, and they were never heard from again. A year after the departure of the Catalan wise man, the only one left in Macondo was Gabriel, still at the mercy of the random charity of Nigromanta, and answering the questionnaires of the contest of a French magazine, whose highest prize was a trip to Paris. Orleano, who was the one who received the subscription, helped him fill out the forms, sometimes at home, and almost always between the china pots and the valerian air of the only pharmacy left in Macondo where Mercedes lived, the secret of Gabriel's girlfriend. It was the last that was left of a past whose annihilation was not consummated, because it continued to annihilate itself indefinitely, consuming itself within itself, ending every minute but never ending. The town had reached such extremes of inactivity that when Gabriel won the contest and left for Paris with two changes of clothes, a pair of shoes, and the complete works of Rabelais, he had to signal the driver to stop the train. To pick it up. The old street of the Turks was then a corner of abandonment, where the last Arabs were carried away to death by the ancient custom of sitting at the door, although toward toward many years they had sold the last diagonal yard, and only the decapitated mannequins remained in the gloomy display cases. The Banana Company town, which Patricia Brown perhaps tried to evoke for her grandchildren on the intolerance and pickled cucumber nights of Prattville, Alabama, was a plain of wild grass. The elderly priest who had replaced Father Angel, and whose name no one took the trouble to find out, waited for the mercy of God stretched out in a hammock, tormented by arthritis and the insomnia of doubt, while the lizards and the rats disputed the inheritance of the neighboring temple. In that Macondo forgotten even by the birds, where the dust and the heat had become so tenacious that it was difficult to breathe, secluded by loneliness and love and by the loneliness of love in a house where it was almost impossible to sleep because of the din of the red ants, Orleano and Amaranta Ursula were the only happy beings, and the happiest on earth. Gaston had returned to Brussels. Tired of waiting for the plane, one day he packed essential things and his file of correspondence in a small briefcase and left with the intention of returning by air before his privileges were transferred to a group of German aviators who had presented to the provincial authorities a more ambitious project than yours. Since the afternoon of their first love, Orleano and Amaranta Ursula had continued to take advantage of the husband's few carelessness, loving each other with gagged ardor in random encounters and almost always interrupted by unforeseen returns. But when they were alone in the house they succumbed to the delirium of late love. It was an insane, maddening passion that made Fernanda's bones tremble with fear in her grave, 
and kept them in a state of perplexed exaltation Petua. The screams of Amaranta Ursula, her dying songs, broke out the same at two in the afternoon at the dining room table, as at two in the morning in the barn. What hurts me the most, he laughed, is so much time we lost. In the days of passion, he saw the ants devastating the garden, satiating his prehistoric hunger in the woods of the house, and he saw the torrent of living lava taking over the corridor again, but he only cared to fight it when he found it in his bedroom. Orleano abandoned the scrolls, did not come out of the house again, and answered the letters of the Catalan scholar in any way. They lost the sense of reality, the notion of time, the rhythm of daily habits. They closed doors and windows again so as not to delay in undressing procedures, and they walked around the house as remedios, the beauty, always wanted to be, and wallowed naked in the mudflats of the patio, and one afternoon they were on the verge of drowning when they loved each other. In the pool. In a short time they did more damage than the fire ants, they smashed the living room furniture, ripped with their follies the hammock that had resisted Colonel Orleano Buendia's sad love affairs in the camp, and they gutted the mattresses and emptied them on the floors to suffocate in cotton storms. Although Orleano was a lover as fierce as his rival, it was Amaranta Ursula who commanded with her crazy wit and lyrical voracity that paradise of disasters, as if she had concentrated in love the indomitable energy that the great-great-grandmother devoted to the manufacture of candy animals. Furthermore, while she sang with pleasure and laughed at her own inventions, Orleano became more absorbed and silent, because his passion was absorbed and scorching. Yet they both reached such extremes of virtuosity that when exhausted in exaltation they made better use of exhaustion. They gave themselves over to the idolatry of their bodies, discovering that the tediums of love had unexplored possibilities, much richer than those of desire. While he was kneading Amaranta Ursula's erectile breasts with egg whites, or softening her elastic thighs and her ripe belly with coconut butter, she played dolls with Aureliano's marvelous creature and painted clown eyes with lipstick and Turk's mustaches with charcoal on his eyebrows, and he wore organza bow ties and little silver paper hats. One night they smeared themselves head to toe with peaches and syrup, licked each other like dogs and loved each other like crazy on the corridor floor, and were awakened by a torrent of meat ants preparing to devour them alive. In the pauses of delirium, Amaranta Ursula answered Gaston's letters. He felt so distant and busy that his return seemed impossible. In one of the first letters he related that his partners had actually sent the plane, but that a maritime agency in Brussels had mistakenly shipped it to Tanganyika, where it was delivered to the scattered Macondo's community. The confusion caused so many setbacks that the airplane alone could take two years to recover. So Amaranta Ursula ruled out the possibility of an untimely return. Orleano, for his part, had no more contact with the world than the letters from the Catalan sage, and the news he received from Gabriel through Mercedes, the silent apothecary. At first they were real contacts. Gabriel had had his return ticket reimbursed to stay in Paris, selling the old newspapers and the empty bottles the maids brought out of a gloomy hotel on Rue Dauphine. Orleano could then imagine him wearing a high-necked sweater that he only took off when the Montparnasse terraces were filled with spring lovers, and sleeping during the day and writing at night to confuse hunger, in the room smelling of boiled cauliflower foam where he had to die Comedor. However, their news gradually became so uncertain, and the letters of the wise man so sporadic and melancholic, that Orleano got used to thinking of them as Amaranta Ursula thought of her husband, and they both remained floating in an empty universe, where the only everyday and eternal reality was love. Suddenly, like a boom in that world of happy unconsciousness, the news of Gaston's return arrived. Orleano and Amaranta Ursula opened its eyes, they probed their souls, they looked at each other with the hand on the heart, and they understood that they were so identified that they preferred death to separation. Then she wrote her husband a letter of contradictory truths, in which she reiterated her love and her longing to see him again, while admitting as a fatal design the impossibility of living without Orleano. Contrary to what they both expected, Gaston sent them a calm, almost paternal answer, with two entire pages devoted to warning them against the fickleness of passion, and a final paragraph with unequivocal vows that they would be as happy as he was in his life. Brief Marital Experience 
It was such an unexpected attitude that Amaranta Ursula felt humiliated at the idea of having provided her husband with the pretext he wanted to abandon her to her fate. The resentment worsened six months later, when Gaston wrote to him again from Leopoldville, where he had finally received the airplane, only to request that they send him the velocipede, which of all that he had left in Macondo was the only thing he had for him sentimental value. Orleano bore with patience Amaranta Ursula's spite, he made an effort to show her that he could be as good a husband in good fortune as in adversity, and the daily urgencies that besieged them when they ran out of Gaston's last money created a bond between them. Solidarity that was not as dazzling and cappy too as passion, but that helped them to love each other so much and be as happy as in the troubled times of salaciousness. When Pilar Turner died they were expecting a child. In the torpor of pregnancy, Amaranta Ursula tried to establish an industry of necklaces made of fish vertebrae. But with the exception of Mercedes, who bought him a dozen, he couldn't find anyone to sell them to. Orleano was aware for the first time that his gift of languages, his encyclopedic wisdom, his rare ability to recall without knowing the details of events and remote places, were as useless as his wife's legitimate stone chest which at that time must have been worth as much like all the money that the last inhabitants of Macondo could have had, together. They survived by miracle. Although Amaranta Ursula did not lose her good humor, nor her wit for erotic antics, she acquired the habit of sitting in the corridor after lunch, in a kind of insomniac and pensive nap. Orleano accompanied her. Sometimes they remained silent until nightfall, facing each other, looking into each other's eyes, loving each other in peace with as much love as before they loved each other in scandal. The uncertainty of the future made them turn their hearts to the past. They saw themselves in the lost paradise of the flood, splashing in the swamps of the patio, killing lizards to hang them on Ursula, playing to bury her alive, and those evocations revealed the truth that they had been happy together for as long as they could remember. Delving into the past, Amaranta Ursula remembered the afternoon she entered the silver workshop and her mother told her that little Orleano was nobody's son because he had been found floating in a basket. Although the version seemed implausible to them, they lacked information to replace it with the true one. The only thing they were sure of, after examining all the possibilities, was that Fernanda was not Orleano's mother. Amaranta Ursula was inclined to believe that he was the son of Petra Coates, of whom he only remembered infamy fables, and that assumption produced a twist of horror in their souls. Tormented by the certainty that he was his wife's brother, Orleano took a trip to the priest's house to search the oozing and moth-eaten archives for a certain clue of his parentage. The oldest baptismal certificate he found was that of Amaranta Buendia, baptized in adolescence by Father Nicanorena, at the time when he was trying to prove the existence of God by means of chocolate tricks. He became deluded with the possibility of being one of the seventeen Aurelians, whose birth certificates he traced through four volumes, but the baptism dates were too remote for his age. Seeing him lost in labyrinths of blood, trembling with uncertainty, the arthritic priest who was watching him from the hammock asked him compassionately what his name was. Orleano Buendia, he said. Then don't kill yourself looking for it, exclaimed the priest with final conviction. Many years ago there was a street here called that, and at that time people used to give their children the names of the streets. Orleano trembled with rage. Ah! He said, then you don't believe either. In which? That Colonel Orleano Buendia fought thirty-two civil wars and lost them all, Orleano answered. That the army cornered and machine-gunned three thousand workers, and that the bodies were taken away to be thrown into the sea in a train of two hundred wagons. The priest measured him with a look of pity. Oh, son sighed. Tio Memi it would be enough for me to be sure that you and I exist at this moment. So Orleano and Amaranta Ursula accepted the version of the basket, not because they believed it, but because it saved them from their terrors. As the pregnancy progressed, they became a unique being, increasingly integrated into the solitude of a house that only needed one last breath to collapse. They had been reduced to an essential space, from Fernanda's bedroom, where they glimpsed the charms of sedentary love, to the beginning of the corridor, where Amaranta Ursula sat knitting boots and newborn hats, 
and Orleano answered the occasional letters from the Catalan sage. The rest of the house surrendered to the dogged siege of destruction. The silver workshop, Melchiades' room, the primitive and silent kingdoms of Santa Sofia de la Piedad were left in the depths of a domestic jungle that no one would have had the temerity to unravel. Surrounded by the voracity of nature, Orleano and Amaranta Ursula continued to cultivate oregano and begonias and defended their world with lime demarcations, building the last trenches of the immemorial war between man and ants. The long and unkempt hair, the bruises that dawned on her face, the swelling of her legs, the deformation of the old and loving body of a weasel, had changed Amaranta Ursula the youthful appearance of when she arrived at the house with the cage of unfortunate canaries and the captive husband, but they did not alter the liveliness of the spirit. Shit, he used to laugh. Who would have thought that we were really going to end up living like cannibals? The last thread that linked them to the world broke in the sixth month of pregnancy, when they received a letter that was obviously not from the Catalan sage. It had been franked in Barcelona, but the cover was written in conventional blue ink by a CA administrative writing, and had the innocent, impersonal look of enemy errands. Orleano snatched it from Amaranta Ursula's hands when she was about to open it. Not this one, he said. I don't want to know what it says. As he sensed it, the Catalan sage did not write again. The other people's letter, which nobody read, was left at the mercy of the moths on the shelf where Fernanda once forgot her wedding ring, and there she continued to burn herself up in the inner fire of her bad news, while the lonely lovers sailed against the current of those times. Of end times, unrepentant and unfortunate times, which were worn out in the futile effort to make them drift towards the desert of disenchantment and oblivion. Aware of this threat, Orleano and Amaranta Ursula spent the last months holding hands, ending the sun with love of loyalty that began with outrages of fornication. At night, cuddled in bed, they were not intimidated by the sublunar explosions of ants, nor the roar of moths, nor the constant, clear hiss of weed growth in neighboring rooms. Many times they were awakened by the rush of the dead. They heard Ursula fighting with the laws of creation to preserve the lineage and José Arcadio Buendía looking for the chimerical truth of the great inventions, and Fernanda praying and Colonel Orleano Buendía becoming brutalized with the deceptions of wars and little gold fishes, and Orleano Segundo dying of loneliness in the days of the Parandas, and then they learned that dominant obsessions prevail against death, and they were happy again with the certainty that they would continue to love each other with their apparition natures, long after other species of future animals had told them. Snatch from the insects the paradise of misery that the insects were just taking from men. One Sunday at six in the afternoon, Amaranta Ursula felt the urges of childbirth. The smiling midwife of the girls who went to bed out of hunger made her climb up on the dining room table, hold herself on her belly, and mistreated her with barren gallops until her screams were silenced by the howls of a formidable male. Through her tears, Amaranta Ursula saw that he was a great Buendia massive and willful like the Jose Arcadios, with the open and clairvoyant eyes of the Aurelians, and predisposed to start the line again from the beginning and purify it of its pernicious vices and his lonely vocation, because he was the only one in a century that had been engendered with love. He's quite a cannibal, he said. His name will be Rodrigo. No, her husband contradicted. His name will be Orleano and he will win thirty-two wars. After cutting off his navel, the midwife began to remove the blue ointment that covered his body with a cloth, lit by Orleano with a lamp. Only when they turned him face down did they realize that he had something more than the rest of the men, and they bent down to examine him. It was a pig's tail. They were not alarmed. Orleano and Amaranta Ursula did not know the family precedent, nor did they remember Ursula's dreadful admonitions and the midwife finished reassuring them with the assumption that that useless tail could be cut off when the child changed its teeth. Then they had no chance to think about that again, because Amaranta Ursula was bleeding into an irrepressible spring. They tried to help her with cobweb dressings and ash cakes, but it was like trying to block a spout with their hands. In the early hours, she made an effort to keep her good humor. She would hold the hand of the frightened Orleano, and beg him not to worry that people like her were not made to die against their will, 
and burst out laughing at the truculent resources of the midwife. But as Aureliano's hopes left him, she became less visible, as if they were erasing her from the light, until she sank into slumber. At dawn on Monday they brought a woman who prayed cautery prayers by her bed, infallible in men and animals, but the passionate blood of Amaranta Ursula was insensitive to any artifice other than love. In the afternoon, after twenty-four hours of despair, they learned that she was dead because the flow ran out without aid, and her profile sharpened, and the welts on her face vanished in an alabaster dawn, and she smiled again. Orleano did not understand until then how much he loved his friends, how much he missed them, and how much he would have given to be with them at that time. He put the child in the basket that his mother had prepared for him, covered the face of the corpse with a blanket, and wandered aimlessly through the deserted town, looking for a gorge back to the past. He knocked on the door of the apothecary, where he had not been in recent times, and what he found was a carpentry shop. The old woman who opened the door for him with a lamp in her hand sympathized with his madness, and insisted that no, there had never been a pharmacy there, nor had he ever met a woman with a slender neck and sleepy eyes that her name was Mercedes. He cried with his forehead resting on the door of the old bookstore of the Catalan wise man, aware that he was paying for the late cries of a death that did not want to cry in time to avoid breaking the spells of love. She broke her fists against the mortar walls of El Nino de Oro, crying out for Pilar Turnera, indifferent to the luminous orange discs that crossed the sky, and which she had so often contemplated with childish fascination, on party nights, since the patio of the curls. In the last open room of the dismantled neighborhood of Tolerance, a group of accordions played the songs of Rafael Escalona, the bishop's nephew, heir to the secrets of Francisco el Hombre. The bartender, whose arm was dry and charred from having raised it against his mother, invited Orleano to have a bottle of brandy, and Orleano invited him to another. The bartender told him about the misfortune of his arm. Orleano spoke to him of the misfortune of his heart, dry and scorched for having raised him against his sister. They ended up crying together and Orleano felt for a moment that the pain had ended. But when he was left alone again in the last morning of Macondo, he opened his arms in the middle of the square, ready to wake up the whole world, and shouted with all his soul. Friends are sons of bitches. Necromanta rescued him from a pool of vomit and tears. She took him to his room, cleaned it, made him have a cup of broth. Believing that this comforted him, she crossed out with a charcoal line the countless loves that he still owed her, and voluntarily evoked his loneliest sorrows so as not to leave him alone in tears. At dawn, after a brief and clumsy dream, Orleano regained consciousness of his headache. He opened his eyes and remembered the boy. He didn't find it in the basket. At the first impact, he experienced a burst of joy believing that Amaranta Ursula had awakened from death to take care of the child. But the corpse was a promontory of stones under the blanket. Aware that when he arrived he had found the bedroom door open, Orleano crossed the corridor saturated by the morning size of oregano, and peered into the dining room, where the birth debris still lay, the large pot, the bloody sheets, the flower pots, ash, and the twisted navel of the child in an open diaper on the table next to the scissors and the fishing line. The thought that the midwife had come back for the child in the course of the night gave him a quiet pause to think. He collapsed in the rocking chair, the same one in which Rebecca sat in the original times of the house to give embroidery lessons, and in which Amaranta played Chinese checkers with Colonel Gerinaldo Marquez, and in which Amaranta Ursula sewed the clothes of the child and in that flash of lucidity he was aware that he was unable to bear the overwhelming weight of so much past on his soul. Wounded by the deadly spears of his own and others' nostalgia, he admired the stupidity of the cobweb on the dead rose bushes, the perseverance of the weeds, the patience of the air in the radiant February dawn. And then he saw the boy. It was a parched, swollen hide that all the ants in the world were dragging to their burrows along the stone path of the garden. Orleano couldn't move. Not because stupor had paralyzed him, but because in that prodigious instant the definitive keys of Melchiades were revealed to him, and he saw the epigraph of the scrolls perfectly ordered in the time and space of men, the first of the line is tied in a tree and the last one is being eaten by ants. 
Orleano had not been more lucid in any act of his life than when he forgot his dead and the pain of his dead, and he nailed the doors and windows again with Fernanda's crosses so as not to be disturbed by any temptation in the world, because then he knew that his destiny was written on the parchments of Melchiades. He found them intact among the prehistoric plants and the smoking puddles and the luminous insects that had banished from the room every vestige of the passage of men on the earth, and he did not have the serenity to bring them to light, but standing there, without the slightest difficulty, as if they had been written in Spanish under the dazzling glare of noon, he began to decipher them aloud. It was the history of the family written by Melchiades down to its trivial details, a hundred years in advance Padion. He had written it in Sanskrit which was his mother tongue, and had encrypted the even verses with the private key of Emperor Augustus, and the odd ones with military keys lace hell. The final protection, which Orleano began to glimpse when he allowed himself to be confused by the love of Amaranta Ursula, was that Melchiades had not ordered the events in the conventional time of men, but concentrated a century of daily episodes, so that all coexist in an instant. Fascinated by the discovery, Orleano read aloud, without leaps, the sung encyclicals that Melchiades himself made Arcadio listen to, and which were actually the predictions of his execution, and found the birth of the most beautiful woman in the world announced that he was ascending to heaven in body and soul, and knew the origin of two posthumous twins who gave up deciphering the scrolls, not only because of inability and inconstancy, but because their attempts were premature. At this point, impatient to know his own origin, Orleano jumped. Then the wind began, warm, incipient, full of voices from the past, murmurs of ancient geraniums, sighs of disappointment prior to the most tenacious nostalgia. He did not notice it because at that moment he was discovering the first signs of his being, in a concupiscent grandfather who let himself be carried away by frivolity through a hallucinated wasteland, in search of a beautiful woman whom he would not make happy. Orleano recognized him pursued the hidden paths of his descendants, and found the moment of his own conception among the scorpions and yellow butterflies of a twilight bath, where a craftsman satiated his lust with a woman who gave herself to him out of rebellion. He was so absorbed that he did not feel the second onslaught of the wind either, the cyclonic power of which ripped the doors and windows from the jams, dislodged the roof of the eastern gallery, and uprooted the foundations. Only then did he discover that Amaranta Ursula was not his sister, but his aunt, and that Francis Drake had assaulted Raya Hatcha only so that they could search each other through the most intricate labyrinths of blood, until they engendered the mythological animal that was to put an end to the lineage. Macondo was already a terrifying whirlpool of dust and debris centrifuged by the wrath of the biblical hurricane, when Orleano skipped eleven pages so as not to waste time on two well-known facts and began to decipher the moment he was living, deciphering it as he lived it, prophesying himself in the act of deciphering the last page of the scrolls, as if he were seeing himself in a spoken mirror. Then he took another leap to anticipate the predictions and find out the date and circumstances of his death. However, before reaching the final verse, he had already understood that he would never leave that room, since it was foreseen that the city of mirrors, or mirages, would be swept away by the wind and banished from the memory of men in the instant in which Orleano Babylonia had finished deciphering the scrolls, and that everything written in them was unrepeatable since always and forever because the lineages condemned to one hundred years of solitude did not have a second chance on earth. And One Hundred Years of Solitude Gabriel Garcia Marquez